Good evening, all. We are live. Yes. Hello. You can talk comics and other things. How's everyone like, doing tonight? Did you get to go to the comic shop this week, Wilson? Nope, not at all. I had I had all the plans to go. I was already at some point today. It was like, if I get done on my work by 2, I should be able to get out, get my books, and get back and have dinner way before the show. But I didn't make it. I didn't get it done at 2, and it's like, I'm not going out. And I already got corrections for that project. So it's like... You know, it's like I didn't make it out. My brother's like, you know, the shop will be open tomorrow. It's like you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I needed it for the show. <laughs> I you found know, a I found a roving market at the subway, so I bought comics. Oh, a roving, oh, a wow. pop up market, a pop up comic shop. Yeah, All a right. pop every a pop up everything shop. Uh, oh, if okay. you if you want some cookbooks, they have them as well. I haven't. There used to be guys who sold comic books on the street in Manhattan in the 90s, especially. I haven't seen any in a while, but you'd go there and just be a guy, you know, because there's always guys selling stuff in the street, man, with a little table set up with comic books piled on it. <laughs> yeah, there, there was a guy that used to hang out like if you um, right outside um, uh, the uh, the railway, Long Island Railway. Yeah. There was a guy there outside Penn and, Station. Yeah, used to be a guy there. There used to be at least two guys in New York. I mean, sorry, in the Bronx that I remember. Ah. They had uh, on Fordham Road. There was at least two or three people uh, on various corners, far enough away from each other right. that they weren't really uh, treading on anyone's spaces. And then there used to be a guy named Wilson, of all names. Um, <laughs> Not that far away from where I live, but he would carry comic books in a duffel bag, in in, uh. in a backpack, and he'll walk around and he'll just be holding stacks of comics in his hands, you know, just saying comics, comics. <laughs> and, and I know I bought comics from him. Now I haven't seen that guy in, in since the nineties. I I used to walk from Marvel, which was Twenty uh, Eighth Street and Park Avenue South which is the east side and i used when i used to go through port authority i'd walk up to port authority with its 40th street and 8th avenue on the west side so it was a good 25 minute walk um and i, I used to see at least three guys shelling comic shop comic books on that walk i just you know walk past them never actually yeah. bought any but i would always be like oh I'm selling comic books on the street and bunch yeah. would occasionally stop at one of them and Go, oh, they're selling them for way too much money. <laughs> <laughs> they, they always were. <laughs> Comic Crack is with us, and he's mentioning that, oh, the Koch Warehouse is shutting down. Yeah, we mentioned that last one. I've never been to the Koch Warehouse. so I've been there, I believe, at least once, maybe twice. And <coughs> it, 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 was, it, was, it was a pretty long trip to get there, You know, going from yeah. the Bronx through Manhattan and then going to where they're located in Brooklyn. And even getting off the train, there's a good amount of walking to yeah. get to that warehouse. And and it's a complete warehouse district. There is nothing else there but yeah. the various warehouses. And um, it was what you would think a warehouse full of comics would be like. Mm -hmm. Shelves, you know, uh, metal shelves with all these short boxes and some areas with long boxes. And no organization at all, other than this is trade paperbacks, this is magazines, and then that's just about it. And then <laughs> everywhere else will have like either there's a code word or this alley or that kind of a thing. And it was fun to go through. I probably spent three, four hours just uh -huh. looking through stuff. Now, most why of it is reasonably it priced. Down? I haven't read that. Have you read um, that? What I've read that he's on a month to month lease now. Ah. And they're converting the space for artists. Okay. Is, is what they, they what were they what would I thought it had to be a lease uh, listed thing. as. Yeah. So I guess they're converting the space into artist lofts. Okay. To gentrify. Whether or not an artist is going to be able to afford a loft there. <laughs> who knows? 
I, I can remember um I had friends who used to live in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, the edge of Carroll Gardens. And Carroll Gardens is like um an avenue or so away from the Gowanus Canal. And it's also like the, they lived in the very edge of Carroll Gardens and past that edge was another warehouse district, which was always weird because there was no one there. It was all where we, you know, we used to sometimes we'd walk through there on our way back from a party or, or a night out or whatnot. And you're like, you're, you're like walking back home. And usually, you know, we were walking from like Park Slope to Carroll Gardens. And there's all sorts of peace of people out in Park Slope. And then you hit the canal and you go across the canal to the warehouse district and it's just empty. It's a it's like it's like really weird because like in the middle of this really really busy place is just an empty place. And you're like what's going on here? <laughs> it was always strange to walk through the warehouse section of that part of Brooklyn because you're not expecting it. You don't yeah, cuz everything else is neighborhoods you're walking through. Right. Yeah, that's Weird that's stuff. that's why super villains always had their layers. <laughs> and warehouses, in that, in warehouses. warehouses. Happy uh -huh. Friday, sixty-two. Lefty, yeah, good old abandoned warehouses. <laughs> you think they that still... warehouses would be cheaper because there are so many abandoned warehouses? But no, <laughs> no, not at all. Well, they, they are cheap if you know there's no landlord to pay and you just break into them and have your supervillain layer there. Right. <laughs> no paperwork. Mm -hmm. But but you know abandoned warehouses show up with some frequency on all those uh New York police procedurals. I just oh, saw yeah. one in Law and Order or something. There's always where empty warehouses somewhere. They're not always mm -hmm. abandoned, they're usually empty. Right. I.e. not rented out to anyone. They the villain was just using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I Google Abandoned Warehouse New York, it shows me a website called Atlas Obscura that, <laughs> that talks about 32 abandoned places in New York City, although wow. none of them appear to be warehouses. Uh, but there is, a power, there is a power plant. <laughs> Comic Crack says Fantagraphics did an interview with the owner of a Koch warehouse yesterday. If anyone is curious to hear more, Comics Journal. Okay, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because that's the place I don't don't think I've ever been there. Yeah, like I said, it was it was nice and and the uniqueness of it. There's no real organization that I could see, and and I only been to a portion of it. Because they had like an area, because they used to be open like on Saturdays, right? Or by appointment only. Right. So there was one Saturday I took a trip down there, and it was mainly because I did some comic book work for Joe Koch uh, on a project decades ago. I, I don't even remember the name will come to me eventually, where I was doing some color uh, lettering, and maybe coloring. It's been so long I kind of forgot. But it was more of the sense of, yeah, I'll go check it out. And it was mainly because they owed me money. <laughs> and, you know, it was one of those projects that, you know, it sounds good when it starts and everybody's on board with it. But it starts falling apart near the end and then it's, all of a sudden there was no more money. So I ended up going down there and, like, get some, get, oops, not the light, getting some, um, getting some Waving comics his arms around. In, in lieu of money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got some comics in lieu of money and they, they still owe me a bit but I don't even remember how much it was and I haven't <laughs> been back since it was like it was cool to look through but it, it, it was already stuff that I owned and I can't say I've, I that I found anything unique Um, and they served iced tea for free so that was kind of cool <laughs> you know, that, that's yeah. what I remember from my trip you know, it's funny. I don't think I've ever been there, but I have like a constructed memory of being there in that I've been to Brooklyn, been to the warehouse districts, 
been to the warehouses. I've seen videos of walkthroughs of the warehouse. So it's like my my brain like constructed a memory of walking through the Koch warehouse, even though I've never I don't think I've ever actually been there. <laughs> I kind of have that type of thing with the. Um, oh, what, what's his name's warehouse? Um, the comic book warehouse. My high, my high comic. Mile high. Ah. Mile high. I, I have kind of a memory of that too because I've seen so many walkthroughs. <laughs> it's like, have I been there? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I would have remembered, but you know how memory is. Speaking of memory being tricky, um, Gore Vidal, YouTuber, not the author. Who was on comic? Who Comic Crack had a conversation with last night? And as I was um, going to bed last night, since they're both on the West Coast, I think at, at like just before eleven, there was a, a, a live stream with Comic Crack and Gore Vidal. Oh, um, so I put it on today and was listening to it as I was working. And uh, they brought up uh, Gore Vidal had uh, pointed out. Um, he had his own video on it, and he was also talking about it on uh, Comic Cracks. Rampaging Hulk number four, you know, the black and white magazine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Had so Gore Vidal just found the issue at his local comic shop and got in, and it had this um, Jim Starlin, Alex Nino art. Mm -hmm. Really interesting stuff. Uh, you know, he was showing it off. He's like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't know that existed. Turns out, past Jared knew that exi knew it existed. <laughs> you you gotta talk to that guy. He can probably teach you a thing or two. <laughs> he knows some uh. stuff. <laughs> so anyway, I was like, "Wow, that's really cool." I wonder how much it cost. So I looked up on eBay. It cost about with shipping about twenty dollars on eBay. And I'm like, you know what? That's too much. Besides, I should really check my rampage. I have. I have maybe 10 or a dozen issues of Rampaging Hulk. I don't think I've looked at them since sometime in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, here's, here's a Jim Starlin cover. I had the issue on my shelf all these years, completely forgotten about. Uh, <laughs> amazing, Jared. Yeah, I got to track down that. Let me show you a little... Uh, it's really interesting stuff because Nino really goes to town on the Starlin pencils slash layouts. So it's got some really interesting drawing in it. And I was reading the story. Like I haven't read Rampaging Hulk probably since this came out. And what was interesting about Rampaging Hulk is they were trying to tie it in to the TV. There's weird Hulks. That, they were trying to tie it into the TV show. Like there's some real Alex Nino rendering. And Starlin demon designs. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. really... That's definitely that, that looks like an EC comic old witch right there. Yeah, but that's very creepy. I mean, you, you see Starlin, you're not expecting that at, at all. Yeah, and and especially the design of this guy is very Starlin. Yeah. Yep. So really interesting to uh, and oh, there's but well, you know the rendering is so Alex Nino. Mm -hmm. There's some Starlin poses for you up top. <laughs> but um, what's interesting about this, I think later on they tied it more into the TV show. But in the beginning, they were tying it into those first six issues of the Hulk. Like the Hulk in, in this, like this takes place, I think it mentions like Hulk number four or something like that. In it. And... Um, this takes place. There's some interesting Alex Nino. It looks like he's marker rendering almost with that. That's unusual for Nino, but um, because it, it's Rick Jones and the Hulk and this woman 
who I don't know if she, uh, what's her. I don't think she appeared in the first issue. Um, what's her name? For the cry Lori. It's like I think they were making their own stories up about the mm -hmm. like. I don't know if this woman ever. I don't think this woman ever actually appeared in the first six issues. I don't know exactly when she appeared. The uh, Bill, Bill Mantlo famously introduced her into the regular comic and has the whole, I have no idea who you are and what you're talking and, and what ah, the hell are ah. you. Let's see. where I think they said her name somewhere. Barit. B-E-R-E-E-T. So I and guess she has a, her a floater. She has a floater thing with a, with a mouth. Uh, that accompanies her. Ah, okay. <laughs> but she was just in the very beginning. Then this, you know, Jim Starlin wizard guy transports the Hulk far away to some other world. But it's it, it's I like that a pure Starlin cover there too. I'm doing a little painting. Let's see what Splash Page Comics has to say here about it. I agree. It was tying in the early issues of the Hulk. It was great. Love those mags. Oh, got the full run. Yeah, I think I think later on, because th this was earlier. I, I don't remember. I got this sometime in the 80s, but I didn't get it off the newsstand. I don't think I bought my first Rampaging Hulk magazine till like issue 12 or so. And I think that was tied more into the TV show. So I think that they went from tying it into the like the early Hulks to tying it into the TV show. Hey all on Dead Queen. How many issues total splash page comic? Yeah, how many issues of, there I can't even there was like 24 or 30 issues of Rampaging Hulk. I can't even remember. 27. 27? Yeah, including the ones after it turned into a color magazine. Right, right. Those ones had some of the early solo Moon Knight stories in them. I yep. was buying it by then, some Sankevich's uh, solo Moon Knight. But this was really interesting to read. Let me get rid of that phone. As he chucks it across the room. <laughs> <laughs> I myself has never read an issue of Rampage and Hulk. They weren't around when I was buying comics. So I never read Rampage and Hulk. I never got those bizarre adventures. Um, and there was quite a few black and white magazines. I, I'm, I know I've picked up Conan stuff. But I didn't really touch any of the other superhero black and white magazines because by then, I don't think they were really making any. And the bizarre adventure I saw that had the X-Men on the cover, it was like, that was an expensive book that I saw in the comic book shop. Yeah. So I never picked it up because when I saw it, it was a back issue. And of course, if it's the X-Men on it, it's automatically six bucks on top of whatever price they were planning to put that book and what it was worth. So I never read any of the magazine ones. I have no idea of their stories. And, um, you know, I don't even know if they were ever collected, as far as I'm aware of. But I never went looking uh, for them. There is an Essential Rampaging Hulk Volume 1, which goes up to 13 or 14. Okay. Yeah, but the rest isn't was uncollected, I think. No, yeah, I, I, don't know I, if, I don't know if, there's I, the, if they ever did an omnibus. I started buying the magazines, probably I was 12 or 13, when there was one store near me that started getting them in. So I always bought Bizarre Adventures and Savage or whatever else I could find. But I, um, I, don't think the, the, I don't think the magazine was there to avoid the comics code. There's nothing in this that couldn't be printed in a regular Hulk issue. I think they were just putting out black and white magazines to make money. Like, is that, yeah, I, I was curious if was that a popular line, and why was the Hulk pick, or was it picked because of the TV show? Most likely, think... you'll remember that besides Conan, the the other thing that they published was a Deadly Hands of Kung Fu. So right. having a Kung Fu magazine that appealed to the people who were not willing to buy comics well, it was probably a good idea, and the the Hulk kind of went and... the, the same way. Bloodstone right, okay. backup story. Yeah. Val Mayer wow. art. And and John Warner scripted both of these. Mm. The plot was by Starlin, but the script by was somebody by the name of John Warner. John was Warner the editor was he, yeah, he was writer and editor in the 70s, and he completely disappeared from comics. 
Oh. After Shooter took over uh, as editor in chief, was, he must have been the editor of their black and white line because I don't I don't recognize his name at all. Yeah, it's, it's in a lot of Planet of the Apes as well. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. right. They also have Planet of the Apes. Oh, magazine. the design of this was John Romita Jr. Seventy-seven. I guess he was working in the office. Art consultant Len Grow. Who? L e n g r o w. Who's that? I don't he must know. Must have been a magazine Art guy. Art, yeah, he probably was a magazine guy. He was probably someone hired for them to help put together a magazine. I would imagine that that's and why the production. Like that. The production was uh, Davida Lichter Dale. I've never heard of uh, him. And Howard Bender. I didn't realize Howard Bender did production for Marvel. He's an artist who did things over the years, including what was that one he did? Mr. Fix-It for Apple Comics. Oh, Jim Stoller and Dana did the cover. Maybe Dana did the painting. D-A-I-N-A, -A, whoever that might be. It's probably da Dana Gretzionis. She was, uh, she, wasn't she Starlin's wife? I don't know. She colored, Star uh, she colored Starlin stuff. Okay, that must be who it is. Yeah, I never see that. Yeah, I never see Rampage and Hulk. Came out in 1977. Right. Yep. The mag format never got reprinted. Yeah, except for that one. Essential. Essential. Mm -hmm. Nice, I made it. All the world's a stage is here. How's everyone? We're doing okay tonight. <laughs> is it time to tell her to Hulk smash the like button? <laughs> yeah, if you want to. <laughs> Ramita and Jim Lee are my favorite. Aha. They epic Marvel stuff was a mag format too, I think. Uh, yeah, there there was an epic magazine that came yeah, out, and that, epic, that was one of my epic favorites. Up. Yeah, epic I picked epic up. Epic Illustrated. Because that was in began... color and that was very like heavy metal. Yeah, yeah. That was more adult. That had stuff they wouldn't publish, and that had nudity in it and stuff they wouldn't publish in a regular Marvel comic. Epic Line had a hot lot of hidden gems. They did. Love the early smashing destruction Hulk tear up everything in sight for no reason other than was in their way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that early Hulk was just destructive. Yeah, I gotta read some. I had fun reading. Like I said, I I didn't even realize I had it. I was like, I, I better check and see if that's on my shelf before I uh, think about purchasing this Jim Starlin and Alex Nino art. There, there's a fun little battle scene right there. A Hulk fighting this monster. And you know what? Uh, like I said, I didn't get this new. It was probably in this condition when I got it. But every issue of Rampaging Hulk out there is, like, good. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's any, like, mint condition Rampaging Hulks. They just don't exist. <laughs> just... Conan, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, Rampaging Hulk were in the magazine stands and getting bought by guys that didn't buy comic books as much. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, definitely. I think that's who Marvel was. They, they, they were aiming at the same people who bought Warren magazines. And magazines in general. So, it was interesting. Which, like, the, the, there used to be three newsstands that I went to as a kid. There was a 7-Eleven that was right behind my house. There was a Stout Steve's that was a couple miles away. And there was this little store that I discovered last of the three of them called Mary's, a little like candy store. And Mary's was the one that had all the magazines. So I'd make sure to, in my rounds of looking for comics on the newsstand, that I'd always go to Mary's to see what magazines they had. And that's where I'd get my Rampaging Hulks. And uh, like I, said, I don't think I picked up Rampaging Hulk nearly till the end. When I think most of my Rampaging Hulks were in color. With Moon Knight backups. I love that Sienkiewicz Moon Knight. Hulk and the Agents of Smash was a good series. Never read that one. Charlton put out Hell Rider and some. I don't think I ever saw any Charlton. I didn't even see any Charlton comic books on the newsstand, except for briefly in the early '80s when they had a revival. 
Uh, Hell Rider wasn't Charlton. Charlton didn't, never put out magazines. Uh, it was Skywald. Skywald. Okay. Yeah, Charlton Bullseye made a comeback in the early eighties. Yeah, but Cut. Charlton Bullseye was not published directly by Charlton. No. I don't think. I wonder no, about it because because Charlton hadn't been around in a while, and all of a sudden right. Charlton Bullseye came out on the yeah, newsstands. It, it was sort of a prosine because yeah. I think Bob Lighton was involved in it. There was definitely an amateur quality to it, which of course I was fine with because I like the weird stuff. I don't think I ever picked up those magazines either. The only that, magazines that I was picking up, huh? Charlton Bullseye was a comic sized one. Was it? Oh, okay. But it, but but it came out sort of only briefly in the early 80s and irregularly. I still have my issues somewhere. Those I know <laughs> I still have. don't know what's in them. I think I looked through those a few years ago at the Tom Sutton that was in them. I was like a lot of my Hulk mags came from a store called Jolly Rogers Convenience Store. There we go. My bad, I meant the cartoon series. Oh, the uh Hell Rider cartoon series. No, okay. Hulk in the Ages of Smash. What was that? Hulk in oh, the Ages of, Ages of Smash. Smash was the cartoon series? Was the cartoon yeah. series, yeah. Okay. Was that one of those French ones? French? Like the Fantastic Four was like a French series that came over here like uh, in the early 2000s or something. I remember someone saying. I didn't really watch them. There was it was a around few... that time period, but I didn't know if uh, French animators were on those. Yeah, someone told me it was. It came from. It was French. I, I I won't swear to it. I only read it once, but um, and that was a long time ago. But I think they did. A, there was a few series that they did in France from Marvel that came over here, but I don't really remember. I didn't watch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> So now that you found that issue, did you reread the actual issue or did you just yeah. look through it? I, I read so, the issue this afternoon. So was the story good? Yeah. Or was it that you read it the one time, put it on the shelf and never needed to go back to it? It was it was a solid story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to tell you it was the greatest story ever. You have to read it. But it was a pretty well, pretty well done story. It was a... Um, once again, Hulk and Rick Jones and Barit were hanging out in one of those caves the Hulk was always hanging out in in uh, um, the first six issues. And they found this equipment left behind by some alien race. They're trying to figure it out. Meanwhile, across the galaxy somewhere, this super scientist magician guy is like, ooh, the Hulk, I need him. And transports the Hulk across the galaxy in an instant to his place, and I'm like Hulk's, I need Hulk, I need you. And he's like, Hulk's like, why don't I just smash you right now? <laughs> and so he did something where he was trying to make the, he was trying to give the Hulk Bruce Banner's mind, but it was really he really just gave him part of Banner's mind, and the Hulk was just still angry all the time. Okay. And so then he and the Hulk. Uh, went out to this this magician guy used to used to live on this planet which was perfect everything was great they they saved they you know everybody had their needs taken care of they could sit back and um, you know explore art and science and the human mind and all that stuff and this guy said he grew a, he was and this guy was like the leader of that planet. And he's like, I think I grew a little lazy and content and somebody conquered the planet. And he was off in his astral form somewhere contemplating the universe. And they severed the line between his astral form and his body. And so he couldn't help save his planet. By the time he got back to his body, he doesn't even know how many years later. His whole planet was like wiped out. So now he got the Hulk to help him wipe out the guys who wiped out his planet <laughs> so that's what that's what this he and the hulk they, they you know they get together then, then the what's interesting about it too is the ending was um the hulk and this guy 
wiped out these uh, few people. There's only a few handful of them who wiped out his planet. Then he sent the Hulk back home and blew up his planet. He was like, "This is this is the end. I just want an end for all of us because there's no there's no coming back. This planet is not coming back. It's dead. They killed it. So I'm gonna blow it up. So he ended up blowing up the whole planet." <laughs> <laughs> okay one of those cosmic jim starlin stories <laughs> right that just happens to have well in it <laughs> yeah i like the ted mckeever's metropole and they are rare to find now in the wild the story and art made you not look away i didn't read metropole i have one collected edition of it. it's like i didn't start collecting ted mckeever till like the 2010s i collected i read some of his stuff in the 90s then like stopped reading his stuff and then like his last three series before he retired i collected and then i was like oh he's retiring oh well i guess no more like what was it miniature jesus i bought i bought pencil head and there was one other in there i bought and then like pencil head was his last one he retired after that but yeah, I liked his stuff at the end. One of those artists that got better with age. Yeah, I, I bought his stuff. Hulk and Agents of Smash was from 2013. Not French, though. Okay. Not a bad kids cartoon, says on Dead Twitter. World War Hulk. I, love, I actually I actually read... Um, I didn't... Well, I tried to read World War Hulk. I read Planet Hulk. Uh, that was a time I was looking for stuff to buy. And everyone had said Planet Hulk was pretty good. So I think I, I was buying collected editions of things. I bought a Planet Hulk collected edition and enjoyed it. And then I tried to read World War Hulk. And despite the cool name, I didn't like that one as much. The, the thing about World War Hulk is that you need to conclude uh, what, what happens in Planet Hulk. Yeah. Uh, but... It, it turns into a um, re revenge story pretty quickly, and since it's the Hulk, it's just destroy destroying things. I don't even I don't even remember a thing in it, except that it, I didn't like. I, I may have, I may have read one trade of it or given up after one trade of it, but then I went and got. Um, it was funny because, like I said, at the time it was. This is probably the late um, aughts. And I was looking for, I had no, there were like no comics on my pull list anymore, except for Usagi Ujimbo, Savage Dragon, and a few other long time things I collected. But so I was looking for things to buy. So I was trying indies. It was before sort of um, Saga hit and Image took off with a ton of indie stuff. Um, so I was looking to buy some Hulk, like World War Hulk, but I, I just wanted like Bruce Banner Hulk, and it like didn't exist. It wasn't there. So I ended up buying some cheap editions of Scar, Son of Hulk, which were actually pretty good. I remember I enjoyed those. They're still on my shelf somewhere, but that wasn't bad, Scar, Son of Hulk, which was a Planet Hulk tie-in. He's the son he left back on Planet Hulk. S K A A R, I think they spelled it. But those were all right. They were bad. I read some of that Red Hulk stuff, not very good. Didn't like it much. But I just kind of gave up. Because uh, occasionally I'd get a stat nostalgic, because Hulk was my favorite from my childhood. Occasionally I'd get nostalgic and go, oh, I don't want to read some Hulk, but there's no nostalgia value to a million different Hulks I don't recognize. <laughs> Yep. And if they're not good comics, there's really no value to them. Yeah. Uh, they, they turned Rick Jones into the, into a blue abomination. Uh, literally, it was the, the abomination, but blue. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, that, we need a chart from every minor character from like 1961 to 1965 Marvel, who's now a superhero. <laughs> it's like It's like all of them are. Yeah, all of them have superpowers now. <laughs> Every yeah, single they, one of them. They give Pepper Potts an armor. Yeah, an armor. rescue. I read some of that even back in that day. I think the only <laughs> one who never got powers is Sharon Carter, but she doesn't need 
She does need him because she's already an agent of Shield. Right, right. <laughs> Richard Corbin's Hulk mini is pretty fun. Yes, I did read that one too. That one is in the collected because I was buying some cheap Hulk hardcovers. Um, who who did the Hulk where he wasn't talking? Where you? It, it was like the Hulk as the fugitive. So it's like you never saw the Hulk. You only saw Bruce Banner. And whenever he turned into the Hulk, they like just be, I can't, Bruce Jones, the Bruce Jones written Hulk with, uh, I think, J.R. Jr. I think in volume one or two of that Hulk is the Richard Corbin Hulk. And that's really good. I really enjoyed that stuff. That was fun. Evening, Eric P. Banner, yes, that was the name of that series, Banner by uh, Richard Corbin. That is in those Hulk hardcovers. I still pick up Savage Dragon. Crazy, yeah. Larson's been doing it so consistently for so long. Like I said, Eric Larson to me is like, you know, a lifetime Oscar achievement winner. He's just, you know, Savage Dragon, maybe it's never been like one of the top 10 comics on the newsstand at any given time. But it's been closer than any comic for longer. It's like no comic has been as good as Savage Dragon for as long as Savage Dragon. Just nothing. Usagi Ujimbo, that's it. <laughs> but, which isn't really a superhero comic, so it's tough to compare. But like, just nothing. It's really, uh, really weird. Stark should just be handing out armor to everyone in the Marvel Universe. I think he is. <laughs> Everybody, Spider-Man had armor. Daredevil had armor. Mm -hmm. The the what's ridiculous is that there was a whole storyline about Tony Stark destroying everyone's suits of armor because he, he wanted to be the he wanted nobody to have access to the technology. What was that armor then, wars? Yeah, it was Armor it was, Wars. It, yeah, it was yeah. Armor Wars, but it was like they stole his technology right. in the first place, and he went after it. What was amazing in the story, and again, I'm only remembering it with the kid's eyes of when I first read it, that was um, he was attacking superheroes that had armor that had nothing to do with his own armor. Uh. So Stingray, uh, a, a character who has happens to be uh, a sea theme scientist right. character. He had armor in his sting suit, and Tony went after him, beat him up, only to find out his suit wasn't running on uh, on, on that technology. And this mm -hmm. is when Captain America himself, I believe, had a suit to keep him alive because he was yeah. being poisoned by the uh, super soldier serum for the, I don't know, second time? <laughs> yeah, and the. Uh... The gremlin uh, was wearing uh, titanium man's armor at the time. Yes. Uh, and Tony set his armor on fire. <laughs> Tony <laughs> killed the the gremlin ah. during the armor wars. Also, and of course, the, there was also the jailbreak at the vault because he went after all of the guardsmen. Ah. Of course, yep. the, here's, here's the stupid thing. When... Be, when Tony owned Stark International, he provided armor for the guardsmen. Yeah, he leased he lost, that out. <laughs> no, he lost control. Uh, ah. He got drunk. He got drunk. He lost control of Stark. Stark became Stain International. Stain right. continued to provide armor, but it was lower quality armor. Right. So it wasn't even the same armor, <laughs> <laughs> which which explains how Tony got, uh, got got through all of them so quickly. Uh, armor. What was that? The eighties? Yeah, late eighties. Yeah. 80s. By the way, Stingray always had one of the coolest costumes to me. Mm -hmm. I always liked Stingray's costume. Very. I don't know who designed it, but it was well designed. If it was never, it was Bu Busema. Uh, John it's Busema the, Pro. It's from the Submariner, right? Yeah. 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 I guess it's kind of the reason why uh, they brought uh, they brought back uh, Stingray in the in Roger Stern's Avengers because jo uh, John was drawing the the Avengers uh -huh. and and since 
um, they had destroyed. Remember, the Masters of Evil had destroyed the mansion, and mm -hmm. they moved. And they moved to to Hydro Base, which was run by by Stingray. Uh -huh. So R R Stingray was reintroduced to the comic, but he never became a a full fledged member of the team. Huh. Totally awesome Hulk wasn't bad. Was bad. Uh, Didn't, yeah, is that the um it was Amadeus Cho. Amadeus Cho. Here's the thing. Amadeus Cho was an was a very interesting character, and by turning him into a Hulk knockoff, they turned he stopped being uh, being interesting to become the knockoff he was never meant to be. I read a bit of the incredible Hercules from that time, right before that. Oh, that that was fun. That was a that pretty was a good book. book. That was a pretty good one. I'm talking everybody. Aunt May hasn't got hers yet. She she needs her armor. She needs her superpowers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was a herald of Galactus called Golden Oldie. Any more wars? No. More wars or not. I think it was Stingray that was in the recent FF Giant Size book. Okay. That well, one just Stingray came out last is... week or the week before. Stingray is credited to Roy Thomas and Bill Everett. Oh, Bill Everett. Wonder if he That's designed. He's credited Stingray. for the the creation of Stingray. Okay. Uh, he he appeared in Tales to Astonish '95, back in 1967. So I don't know if that's the same yeah. design. I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to look. But Bill. But it doesn't look like John Bus John Buscema was never particularly good at designing costumes. Right. He did draw a Submariner at the time. Uh, yeah. Maybe he did. But so did Everett. Right, right. Everett because he some, came back. Everett okay. did some nice covers for Submariner around issues 50, like from the 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. and 60s. There were some there were some really nice Bill Everett covers, especially some of those 10th anniversary covers. There's one with like one with Doctor Doom, I think I remember around issue 49 or 50 that's really good. Mm -hmm. That's a, he had a nice run of uh, cover. I don't know who's. I don't think because um, he also Bill Everett did a nice run of covers with uh, Marie Severin too. But I don't think she did those ones with him. Mm -hmm. You know that Stingray is a uh, Tiger Shark's brother-in-law. Didn't know that. <laughs> that I think I did know. Everybody's yeah. related to everybody. Yeah, Sting Stingray married married Tiger Shark's sister. <laughs> Want to show us one of the comics you got this week, Paolo? What did you get? Yes. Okay, so this was a French science fiction series called Crystal. Let me get you solo so we can see it. All right, okay. And uh, the, the Portuguese publisher only only put out the first two back in the 80s. Uh -huh. uh, there, are, there were five albums, and then the, the creators put out three more uh, as self-published, self like 15 years after the... the after the other one, uh, the art's pretty good because the the artist's Italian, so he's used to drawing. He, he used to work for the um, for the lowbrow uh, French publishers that that had the rights mm -hmm. to the superheroes. Uh, in France, publishing superheroes means you're lowbrow. <laughs> the I, I like the art. The 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 story's kind of childish. Uh, it, it's about it's an alien that that crash lands on Earth. Turns out he's the the savior of these people, but he can't remember. He's a he's amnesiac, and he's got some superpowers. And he finds the the uh, teenage sidekick to help him out. Turns out the Am the the alien is allergic to water. Amnesia is like the all purpose plot device. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting. You know? It can drive so but, many stories. <laughs> there were there were so many adventure uh, adventure comics in 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 France back in the seventies and eighties. A lot of them uh, lost steam after the nineties. Yeah, uh, so, and others got others were forgotten, like this one. Right. But I saw this uh, and I thought, man, I, sh I should really have this. <laughs> Richard says, "Tiger Shark." That must be a uh, tiger shark. Must be the sister of Stingray. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's just she's just a, a doctor. Oh yeah, I got a name for you this week, uh, Paolo. 
Where is it? I I bought six comics. Two of them are first issues. Mm -hmm. Um, this one I bought for the art looked really nice. Helen of Windhorn. It's got some. Like I said, I, I flipped it open. And it's funny. There's one cup. Th this is this this art looks very European. Yeah. Um, and the guy's the name is Bill Keys Evely. Where is it? Bill Keys. B I L Q U I S. There's a name I've never heard before. Okay, so she is Brazilian. Ah, she. Okay. And she's must have been working on superheroes. This is uh Tom King is writing it. Where's I think I showed those there. There's a nice there's a nice architectural drawing for you. Mm -hmm. And it's the story. Let's see what year does it uh it, it's being told in hindsight. Um they're interviewing this old lady who's I guess her I guess her employee her employer was this like pulp writer who was very famous. And so she gets she gets hired to this is this this is the 16 year old um daughter I think of the is her father no her father's not the pulp writer her grandfather is. So her grandfather owns this big house Windhorn I think is somewhere in Texas, if I remember right, or it's out in the middle of nowhere. And so this lady, when she was young, was hired to be her governess and tutor her. And so she goes to pick her up and, he, and she's this wild 16 year old who's lost both her parents. They're both dead. Who's in this town, kicked out of the hotel she was in. She hangs out at the bar drinking. So then she brings her by train back to this um back to her grandfather's house who's now going to be caring for her and her grandfather wasn't even there he was off on some book tour or something but the butler was that like at this big house is like a butler and two cooks a gardener and this governess and the girl it's like they don't even have a big staff they said and the 16 year old girl proceeded to pillage the wine cellar and just drink herself into a stupor every night so they don't know what to do with her <laughs> Um, and then a giant monster attacks. And at the end, the grandfather shows up with a giant sword, having killed the giant monster. <laughs> and you're like, okay. <laughs> but I mean, like I said, it also, this is, um, I think this is pre-war, so it was like 1939 or something. And the old woman is actually there's she's actually being interviewed by this young guy who's like a fan of the grandfather's books. Uh and, and like that he's a famous author. So and and they mentioned like um Oh, on like at one point in the book, uh, where does it say? After she picks up the 16 year old girl from who was in the drunk tank in prison, she says, um, she's like, Oh, I got one more stop before we go back to my grandfather's house. And, and she stops to get a tombstone for her father. When it says her, and according to this tombstone, her, um, her father was Christopher Krieger Cole, 1900 to 1935, which means he died at 35. And since she's 16, he was a young father. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, she says uh, on the tombstone, she wants Christopher Krieger Cole, 1900 to 1935. And below it, just better than Shakespeare. <laughs> and... 
maybe her father was the writer. I don't remember. But then the the guy who's interviewing her says something like, um, where is it? Uh, oh, here. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Oh, you know, there have been a lot of arguments between scholars over what the inscription means, if any, if it if it explains anything. People have published on the subject. It's fascinating. The general consensus seems to be that they were his last words before he killed himself, that he dictated them. I don't think anyone's attributed it yet to Helen. <laughs> and then the old lady says, well, I helped her spell Shakespeare. <laughs> Do you know what it means? Hmm, I learned. So I guess we're going to learn that what that means as the story goes on. But it was a pretty interesting little story. And like I said, I really liked the art by Bill Key. Is that how you say it? Bill Keys? Bill Keys, yeah. Bill Keys? Bill Keys Everly. Tom King knows how to find good artists. Yeah. Because... No, no he just needs a good, a good writing teacher. <laughs> His writing is good enough to me... That I buy his stuff, his indie stuff at least, because he always has good artists. Or somebody that teaches him how to manage ex expectations. <laughs> see, I never had expectations. Let's see what's going on here. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. Is it good, Tom King? See, it's okay, Tom. So I like, like, I love. Um, Love Everlasting, not because of Tom King. Tom King's writing is solid, but uh, um, Elsa Chartier, Chartier's art is really makes it for me. The art really made it for me here. So as long as the writing isn't terrible, <laughs> it's solid. I'm not going to tell you it's the best writing I've ever read, but it works. And it, and it works a lot. Awesome artwork. It works a lot because of the artist, that female. Is there such a thing as good Tom King? Yeah, there's at least such a good thing as I think he makes some good in like I read the only thing I read of his that wasn't an indie book was um Mr. Miracle. Is that the one he did? You did Mr. Miracle, yes. Right. I I took that one out of the library years ago. And the whole time I was reading it, I was like, this would be better if it were an indie book. Because <laughs> because he was using Mr. Miracle and Dark Side and all these guys who come with so much baggage, he kind of had to ignore the bag. Like he even killed Dark Side in it. And yep. you know Dark Side's not really dead. Yep. So it's kind of like, what's the point? So that that like so so like the whole like Mr. It was well done, but the whole thing was like this would be bet if this would have a point if it was an indie book, but it, since it's not, it doesn't really have a point, which is why right. I've liked his indie stuff much better. But most people who have been disappointed by Tom King are superhero fans who are disappointed <laughs> by him. Stingray costume was drawn by Marie Severin. Okay, then she must have the design build of the art of him. Okay, so Marie Severin may have designed it. Yeah. May have, because she did the cover and the interior book when he first appeared right. as Stingray. But right. I think the Bill Everett stories is when he appeared in his secret identity as he was just a scientist at the time in the Namor books. So I uh, guess when they decided to make him a superhero, I could only guess Marie did those designs. It could be. I've never seen any initial designs for it. No, I and haven't Bill either. Bill Keys, uh, is known for Vertigo and Wonder Woman. Okay, Undead Quinn tells us. Oh, all right. That's the Batman and Elmer Fudd short story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that was pretty good. That's a good Tom King. Yeah, everyone seems to like that Tom King one, Batman and Elmer Fudd. Honestly, a story about a teenage alcoholic would have been fine on its own. No need to add the supernatural elements. Yeah. Uh, that's okay with... I would have been okay with no supernatural element. Matter of fact, the supernatural elements make me go, give me pause. <laughs> so, but I'll, I'll buy another issue of it at least because the art is really nice. Elmer Fudd trying to kill Nat Batman. <laughs> 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 I'm Waxley Batman. <laughs> Standard Tom King story, more depression quest. Yeah, when it gets to the point, I want to talk about my mental state. I don't <laughs> want you to talk about your mental state. Fix it. Tom King yeah. is CIA straight up, or is he? 
Tom <laughs> King was a CIA analyst. <laughs> he was a nerd. <laughs> Bayo awesome. Dia, Paolo. I speak yeah. Portuguese. Yeah, cool. We have a few Portuguese people that show up, so yeah. we're, we're used to it. <laughs> Obrigado. <laughs> It was no, about I, Trump. I, we we don't pronounce stuff like the Spaniards or the Italians. We pronounce <laughs> stuff like the French. Ah. It was about trauma. Eh, the thing here's the thing: Tom King did not suffer any trauma. Okay, he was a CIA analyst. <laughs> His trauma was going over numbers. <laughs> hey, numbers can be scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the people who aren't good with numbers. Especially. And the other thing I reread this week, which was weird, was uh, Why I Hate Saturn. Mm. See, that's one of those comics that I'm always telling myself that I got to read one of these days that I never do. Mm -hmm. You got to read this one of these days. Kyle Baker, it came out in 1990, and it's it's got no word balloons in it. It's all text below pictures. But you it barely registers as that. I mean, it, it reads like a comic. I have to say. Um, and it was all about the trauma. <laughs> Numbers can induce trauma too. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> um, but it was really weird reading this because... I don't think I've read it since 1990. And I, I've said this before. Any opinion I have that's over 10 years old is expired. Because I really can't remember the work. Any opinion I have about a comic or a movie, or I can't really remember the work. But I can remember my opinion about it. Um. Love Kyle Baker's stuff. Yeah, I've liked his stuff mm -hmm. over the years, too. Tom King is also Mossad straight up and down. Um, yeah. Kyle Baker is one of the most unappreciated artists in the history of American comics, in the whole history. Yeah. Uh, they should have prizes named after him. <laughs> okay. No, really, no, they really should. Okay. I haven't read I haven't read his stuff in years. I don't know what he's done. Yeah, well, he shows time. up every once in a while. The, yeah. the last plastic thing, the man last was the last thing I remember him doing. Yeah, yeah, but that, that was a long time the, ago. Now, <laughs> the thing about Kyle Baker, okay, so he's not fast, which is why there's a lot of stuff that he does that is just inking, right. but he's very versatile. Yeah. He can do anything you want, either uh, drawing somebody else's script or writing or writing his own. So the fact that people don't talk about Kyle Baker. Uh, as it that that most people don't talk about Kyle Baker or don't acknowledge uh, how much of a genius is a, he is is beyond me. This mm. guy needs to be more well known. Yeah, but th this is like it. My opinion of this from 1990 was that I liked it. It was mostly sort of in a slice of life style. Until it took a weird turn into fantasy, I guess, at the end. And I wasn't fond of the ending, but I remembered none of the details. That that was my opinion of it, I remembered. But I didn't remember anything about it. Matter of fact, the turn at the end was even different than what I imagined it to be because I couldn't remember it. And the turn at the end reading this time didn't bother me at all because I knew there was a turn at the end. Um, but it's, it's really interesting reading it. Um, hello, cavernous comic book brains. Hello there, sleepy reader. It's a cowboy Wally, plastic man, and so much random inking work too, that elevated dog shit comics to veritable masterpieces. That's what Kyle Baker has been up to. But like I said, I read this in 1990. Yeah. Which Your means still I was... Your cup is still piranha press. <laughs> yes. Which means I was 24, 25 whenever I read this, which is right around the age of the character. And now I'm reading it at 57. And I'm and it's weird reading it now, kind of being 
I, I don't actually remember my perception of it at 24, but I can remember what my perception of it at 24 might have been. Um, and it's interesting because it, um, it stars this, uh, this woman, what's her name? Wilson, I can't remember her name. Anne. So it's this woman, Anne, who's a writer and new, and, and I wonder if she's a stand-in for Kyle Baker. She's also got a best friend, boyfriend, who might be a stand-in for Kyle Baker because he kind of looks like Kyle Baker. I actually met Kyle Baker at Marvel in the early 90s. He used to come up a bit. I didn't know him well, but I knew him. Um, and her sister. And so it's about a young woman, probably about the same, probably in her mid-20s, living in New York City, being a writer, she writes for a magazine at one point. She's writing for a magazine, but she's unmotivated. She's lazy. Um, she doesn't have a lot of ambition, but she's a good writer for this magazine, so they keep paying her. Uh, and it's interesting that she she's kind of, um, what is that word where you hate humanity? All of a sudden, uh, uh, kind of flew out of my head as I tried to use she doesn't like people in general but it's funny because I can remember misanthropic misanthropic there's the word that flew out of my head she's a misanthrope and I knew people like I knew I specifically knew few New York City women at that time and dudes always think it's an act they always think, ah, she's just putting on airs. She's not really that way. Because how can a cute young woman who all the guys like really be a misanthrope? <laughs> they really are. And, and and I know my young 24-year-old brain would think that way. And I, I imagine as I was reading this at 24, I would be kind of attracted to her. Going, oh, yeah, you know, even though she's a misanthrope, she didn't... But she's, you know, young, creative, cute. Uh, but my 57-year-old brain doesn't think she's cute. Or doubtless thinks she's cute. Doesn't think she's attractive in the least. Because I, because I don't think she's putting on an act. Like 24-year-old Jared may have thought she was putting on an act. 57-year-old Jared doesn't think the character is putting on an act. Think that, and there's no hint in the... Because Kyle Baker was probably in his 20s when he did this. I don't know what his opinion on her was, if she was, if he thought she was putting on an act or not. But there's no evidence of it to me in the actual book. So it was interesting reading it, um, thinking back on, you know what? I probably liked her slice of life life a lot better when I was 24. Now I'm watching her life going, ooh, she's got it pretty rough. <laughs> and a lot of it's of her own doing, but no one's going to save her. And like back when I was 24, guys would always think they could save women like that. At 57, no one thinks you can save a woman like that. So it's an interesting just thinking about myself reading this in 1990. That's. I just read Kyle Baker's Special Forces. Huh. Kyle Baker did a take in Alice in Wonderland. Wow. Classics Illustrated number three. It's on my nice. want list. So true, Carl Capallo. Kyle Baker can do it all. Shadow was good. Wolfpack. Dick Tracy movie adaptation. Wow. Break the Chain. So much great work. Yes, I'm missing I yep, There's the, the word I couldn't remember. Even though it was, that's a great one. Yeah. Even his work on Deadpool Max. A lot more misanthropes at fifty-seven. There, there <laughs> might be. We at least we believe them now. When they tell us they're misanthrope, we're like, "All right, I believe you." <laughs> you don't even have to tell me. I just found the Raven. Okay, but but it, like it, and it was also interesting. Some things that were a product of their time and are now just gone. Like one of the themes of this book, well, it's not a theme. One of the recurring things that happens in this book is she's a New York City girl. 
in, you know, 1989, 1990, whenever he did this book. She has, she doesn't drive. So therefore, she has no driver's license. She has no driver's license. She has no bank account. Um, so that brings, gets her into trouble at times when she tries to stay at a hotel and running. And they're like, what do you mean you have to, but I, re I remember being, you know, 24 in 1990. I knew people from New York city who had no bank account and no driver's license because they had no, it was common to be in New York city, a New York city, you know, born and bred and have no ID because you didn't drive. There was no, and that's what everybody's state ID was. Matter of fact, I knew a couple of people who in their early twenties got non-driving license just to have an ID. Hmm. Like when, when did you have a driver's license, Wilson? No, I had, uh, for a while I had my learner's permit was uh -huh. what I was using for ID. So I had that for a long time. And um, then eventually I had gotten the, uh, you know, the, the, the regular New York State ID that they issued. So that was, yeah, the non-driver's license. The non-driver's driver's first, license. Yeah. So the first one I got was because I did at, at the appropriate age start to learn how to drive, was in the process. Had a couple of driving lessons. I was so turned off by the lessons. I was like, I'm not driving. <laughs> the teacher I had was terrible. I actually, I was a better driver at the beginning than I was at the end. <laughs> on the very what? first day, took me onto the highway. So it was like, turn here. Okay. Turn here. All right. Turn here. Now we're on the highway. Why did you get on the highway? Why are you yelling at a kid <laughs> who's behind the wheel, technically for the first time, yelling about the highway where it's like, I could just get off on the next, you know, on the next exit. I wasn't an idiot. I knew <laughs> the concept of driving. I know the area. I live in the area. My dad drove all the time. So I know which streets to go down, what little mm -hmm. shortcuts to make. And again, to me, it was like by the end, practically shaking. By the fourth lesson, fourth and last lesson, I was like, "I'm done. <laughs> that is it." So what I used age, that. What age do you think you were when you got the non-driver's license? I was probably, I want to say, nineteen or twenty. Okay. Because I don't know how long I I went with the learner's permit using that as a license because even when the learner's permit expired nobody mm -hmm. cared they always looked at the date right and it wasn't until i was uh it wasn't until i was an adult in my 30s that my uh for for i i i don't remember exactly when i got the non-driver's license i must have got it in my 20s 21 22 because i started traveling more so right. I needed the ID for getting on airplanes and stuff like that before they were really stringent. Um, and I would use that as the ID. And many times it would expire and nobody cared. They just wanted to see right. the date. Mm -hmm. But then one day, uh, I'm, in an, I'm an adult. I'm in my 30s, maybe almost just, just about to hit 40s. Uh, mm -hmm. I had one of the expired ones because I let it lapse. And I was at a bar and they didn't want to serve me. <laughs> they didn't want they did not want to let me in the bar because my ID had expired. And it's like my ID has expired. I have not. I am still <laughs> over what the age was. I was over 40. Because like <laughs> you are aware that my very first beer at 21 is now old enough to drink. <laughs> so what 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 is the actual problem? I was traveling on airplanes with that, with the expired mm -hmm. ID. I was getting into any just about any place right. that needed an ID, even when it was expired. 
but then now it's, you can't do that now. Now you have to have a uh, 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 current ID. It could not. It cannot have been expired. Although my ID currently has expired. I have to go and uh, fix because I I wasn't even aware it expired. Uh, it expired last year, and it expired for five months before I discovered it had expired. But like that's something I had forgot. It was pretty common in 1990 for New York City people in their early 20s to have no bank account, to have no ID. Um, there were people at Marvel in the early 90s who would get their paycheck, walk to the bank, and get their paycheck ca in cash, have their paycheck given to them in cash. Yeah. They had no bank account. <laughs> they just cashed I, their paycheck. I, I would probably say if I did not get a bank account when I was in college, because mm -hmm. it was during a time where there would be the bank would be set up at the college. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to, you know, it's college. So they want to get you early with the credit cards and whatnot. And so that's how I first got a checking account was because there was a setup at the college. If I, I didn't get it, then I probably wouldn't have gotten it until I worked at Marvel. And I did not Marvel, get a credit card till I was 28. Mm hmm. Those were the those were the days they didn't just hand out credit cards. <laughs> I was probably twenty two yeah. when I first got my credit card. Like you said, nowadays they send applications to all the colleges, probably the high schools too these days. <laughs> yeah, well, the colleges they will always be every semester. There will always be the credit card guys sitting there saying, "You want a credit card?" And here here's your free tote bag. It's like I want the tote bag. You know, I'll find I, this thing not knowing what the credit card was really like. I and this was in college, and I had like I had it, I had a Discover card, and I had a uh, probably a Citibank Mastercard. I probably filled out ten credit card applications over the years till I f someone finally sent me one mm -hmm. with like a six hundred dollar limit. Right. Because I had no credit history in those days, you know, they didn't give just give you credit cards. Too nowadays, they're like, "You're you're twelve. You can sign your name here. Here's a credit card, kid. Go buy some yeah. candy. Exactly. Run up some debt." And it's like, and with Marvel, as you mentioned, it's like, yes, I had, to, I had. It was funny because their checks were issued by I think Citibank, so I had to walk up to Citibank to cash the check, and then walk down the street to Chase to deposit it. <laughs> Classics Illustrated had a lot of great teams. Yeah, those first comics ones did. Yeah. Wait, what's that? Oh, Classics Illustrated poem, The Raven. Yeah, also Baker. Sounds like Jared has seen a few MGTOW videos. I have. Whoops, I'm late for class. Sorry, Professor ORMC. I've seen a lot of videos <laughs> on a lot of crazy stuff. Richard Drainer, it was no gay hand Wilson. <laughs> well, since SBPT is here. Uh, might as well just show. Look, Mary Betty Kip. Ah, he, he, knows, he knows what I'm talking about. He, he's the <laughs> one who knows that comment. Uh, SBPT yeah. had a driving instructor from hell too. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what what the what's the problem with driving instructors? And before yeah. fraud, yeah, fraud happens a lot more now. Yeah, now they give credit I'm, cards. Out I mean, like candy. I learned how to operate a clutch and and, and shift gears. So, <laughs> but why I hate learning pattern? experiences, <laughs> good stuff. Like I said, it's mostly slice of life stuff. It's mostly this woman um, living her life in New York City, being a misanthrope. Then her sister comes into town uh, to live with her. Her sister's kind of hiding out. She, she, She's really annoying and can't stand her. I mean, her sister annoys Anne's sister annoys Anne. And her sister says she's from Saturn. That's why I hate Saturn. Um, <laughs> and so then Anne, weird things start happening to Anne. Uh, people who know her, she eventually kicks her sister out of the apartment. She's like, you got to get out of here. You're too annoying. And and the things that annoy her, annoy her are like normal human being things, like cleaning up. 
But the sis, the Anne is such a misanthrope that everything annoys her. And of course, they she talks with her uh, Anne talks with her best friend who looks kind of like Kyle Baker about life, and then hangs out in bars. So it's like lots of slice of life stuff. Um, and then um, the sister disappears. She well, she kicks the sister out of the house. So the sister disappears, and then this dude shows up looking for the sister going oh and here's a funny part too at one point in the game at one point in the book and decides to be hot and that right there is her best her friend the kyle baker stand-in who starts hitting on her on the elevator because he <laughs> doesn't recognize her because <laughs> <laughs> she's all glammed up and she's like, dude, it's me, Anne. He's like, what? <laughs> so this is like, she's like, yeah, I took your advice and decided to be like all those other shallow girls and be hot. And I'll get more stuff if I'm hot. So that's that's that, that was a nice, fun little part of this. And so then, like I said, her sister annoys her so much that she kicks her sister out of the apartment. And people start showing up looking for her sister. And one of the dudes who shows up looking for her sister is this creepy guy. That guy right there. Creepy guy. He's like, where's your sister? And he and he, he starts pretending he's law enforcement or whatever. And she's like, get out of here. She eventually kicks him out. And he's like, listen, I'm a rich guy. I'll ruin your life if you don't tell me where her sister is. She's like, get out of here. So he, in fact, does ruin her life. Uh... She loses her job writing for the magazine. She loses her apartment, I think. And so she decides to go on a quest to find her sister. So the rest of the book is her going on a quest to find her sister. Then she finds her sister and the two of them go on the run together because the rich guy set her sister up as a murder suspect too. By the way, the rich guy is her sister's ex-boyfriend who she's trying to escape. Then I'm going to give away the weird twist because <coughs> it's a book from 1990. <laughs> so we got this sort of Thelma and Louise moment, I guess you'd call it. Where they're on the run. Here they are. They're on the run. In this convertible. Um, they're driving out in the middle of the de desert, having sisterly moments. And the uh, the guy tracked her. There's the rich guy who tracked her down with a whole bunch of cops or armed men, whoever they are. And they're like, okay, it's over. You're coming back with me. And here's the twist where it goes off the rails. And it's like, what is he doing here? Somewhere out of the car, the sister pulls out a rocket launcher and blows up all of the dudes who are chasing her. All of them. <laughs> um, and so then the, the, it ends with the, the two sisters splitting up. Anne goes back to New York City to live her life. And the sister is hiding out somewhere. I guess if you kill a hundred guys, they come after you. So that's kind of how it ends. Um, very weird. You know, it, it was a nice ride that ended with this rocket launcher thing. And then just a little epilogue resolution. So it was a really, really weird. But, but I, I, I think I... Since I knew there was a weird twist coming at the end, I enjoyed the ride a lot better these, what is it, 34 years later. But it's definitely worth a, worth a read. Let's see what we have here. In Portugal, people used to refer to instructors as engineers. I never understood why. Uh, because... Uh, because by law, you, in order to uh, be licensed to become a driving instructor, because it's not like over there. Over there, any schmo can become uh, can become a driver instructor. Here, no. Exactly. Need... That's my problem that I had. He had any you... schmo teaching him. I had any schmo. Here you need you. Here you need a specialist schmo. 
<laughs> you you do need to be to have a degree in automotive engineer in order to be legally allowed to become a driving instructor. Uh, know what Richard Drainer says? Know what else is some classic Baker? Those X Men gag cartoons in Marvel Age. Has anyone oh. picked up the Marvel Age omnibus? Are any of them in there? I think the first what sixty issues of Marvel Age they just put out in an omnibus. I did not pick that up. I don't even think I saw it. Yeah, that's, neither did I. I'm like, I, I don't know what room to take picking that up, but I'd like to look yeah. through it. I would like to look through it too. I might be the lunatic that would pick it up. Uh, and there's a, I prefer the digital of version of it. Yeah, I would too, because opening up one of those tomes it's seems to be a bit much. Yeah, those are big. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude, so good. All those X Men. Ah, uh, yes, Mar Berica. The big editorial mystery. I haven't learned today they had a branch in Brazil. They did. Uh -huh. Baker's the master of both the absurd and the sweet. They're absurd and sweet is definitely both in play in Why I Hate Saturn, which this may be his like signature work, too. I don't know if there's another like Kyle Baker graphic novel like this. Usually when I hear Kyle Baker's name, it's associated with this. Right. And he really should have gone on to do, you know, more stuff like this. But the comics world, I don't think, has ever had a place for Kyle. As talented as he is, the 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 uh, the U.S. comics world has never really had a place for Kyle Baker. Mm -hmm. Which once once again begs the question: Why aren't there more Americans trying to get published in in Europe? Yeah. Europe would have embraced uh, Kyle Baker. I think the, um, the 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 guy who who most mostly is yeah Trondheim, uh, uh, Louis Trondheim is probably the guy who is closest in uh, not not specifically in style but uh, sp spirit uh, closer in uh artistic spirit uh. And, and so if you market kyle baker to tondheim fans he would sell mm -hmm. sleepy reader wonders if baker has been swallowed up by hollywood animation seeing he's done some phineas and ferb well, yeah i don't know i hope he's making a good living out uh in animation if he is because comics probably didn't pay him much <laughs> i still got most of my original yeah it's amazing that this has been sh sitting on my shelf since 1990, unread, but I, I still have it. <laughs> I Die at Midnight comes up a lot when Baker is mentioned. Not my favorite. Oh, I vaguely remember that one. Ooh, I, heard I of Die that at one. Midnight. I don't know if I have it. Kyle Baker is more art world than comics. Yeah. He's definitely, you know what he is? He was... He was an indie guy looking for a place in the mainstream because he had some mainstream talents that the Marvel and DC wanted, some of his drawing and inking, but I don't think he ever really was a Marvel or DC guy. So he was kind of, he's kind of a, um, he fits in less than Keith Giffen. <laughs> Who was always kind of a hard guy to fit in, but he managed to stay in Marvel yeah. and DC Comics for nearly his whole career. Is it just geography that inhibits U.S. creators from getting into band scene? In band uh, scene, no. Also, uh, well, nowadays is probably not so much of a problem, but uh, for a long, long time. Uh, no French editor would demean himself by speaking English to <laughs> to a creator. Ah. <laughs> so you'd have to learn French to be in that magazine. Yes. Although I kind of wonder how how they got uh, Austin Drake and um, what was that thing? Uh, Kelly Green. Oh, okay. Kelly so Kelly Ooh. Kelly Green was uh, Kelly, Kelly Green was made by Stan Drake and, and Leonard and written by Leonard Starr, and th that was a 
made specifically for the French market. There are five graphic novels um, that, that came out in the in the eighties, uh, and they were pretty unique in that regard. So I don't know if Star uh, spoke French because otherwise they wouldn't have given him the time of day. Uh, although I wouldn't be surprised. Some, I mean, these guys who were um, in the arts world in the in the fifties and sixties, if they if they were if they were well educated, they would still speak French even if they were Americans. They would still learn French. Huh. What was why I hate Saturn ever in print after the Piranha Press book? Yes, there was a. There was a reprint with the regular DC logo. I, I'm not. I'm. I never understood why they didn't just republish it as a Vertigo book. That would make sense. But I, but I, could I, I see, think it's out of print right now. I could see this working as a movie too. I mean, I I I rarely care about making comic books into a movie. Mm -hmm. But this seems like it it would be a natural. Uh, you got the storyboards all right here, <laughs> and it's sort of a slice of life story with you know quirky characters with a big explosion in, in the end. I could see it working as a movie, <laughs> but yeah, I haven't. I, I really, I, I think I it, like it, it was really interesting reading it and. Thinking about my perceptions in 1990, reading it too, just like that whole. But besides the book itself, my memory of the book and thinking about how I would have related to the book and how I relate to it now, it's interesting. The passage of time. They should teach French at art school. I took French in high school, but I was never very good at it. Yeah, learning languages in high school. <laughs> you, don't, you don't actually learn a language. No. The, the you know the the best way to want to learn to to learn a language is to want to learn one. Yeah. 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 If you don't want to forget being being you know fifteen years old and having to memorize French words is not what a fifteen year old wants to do. Because mm -hmm. that's all you're doing at fifteen is yeah. memorizing words. Right. You you and you don't memorize words. You have to immerse yourself. You do, you the you don't learn how to speak a foreign language. You you learn how to think in a foreign language. Right. And so so you you're not thinking. So when when you master the language, you're not thinking about it anymore, right. because it just comes out naturally. The I, I, brain brain switches and the the ideas that are associated with the language activate. I've heard people say that you 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 know a language when you start thinking in it. Yeah. Not that I ever have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Kyle Baker and Terry Moore books are good movie material. Yeah. Let mm -hmm. comics be comics. Yeah. That's generally my attitude. I'm mm. a, peop, a lot. I always hear people say, oh, this would make a good movie. Oh, I can't. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if they made a movie out of this? I'm like, well, I really like comics better than movies. Yeah. So to me, it's kind of like, eh. And, and these days, I certainly don't need to see every movie about a comic made from a comic book. <laughs> There's so many of them. My high school French teachers didn't even know French that well. Probably mine didn't even either, but who knows? I'm more interested in people adapting movies into comics. Not a lot of good ones for those either. No, Because usually they're just licensing deals that... Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of good movie adaptations. The only one, and, and Pro good is being probably. generous, is I did like the Independence Day tie-in comics. Oh, wow. There's an obscure yeah. one I never thought was coming. Yeah, yeah but it's still I a tie-in comic. It was, a, even though it's it's used... A, but the, what I liked about it is because they were mm. prequels. Mm. You got to learn a little bit about the characters in the movie before the movie happens. I did I, like that. I, I like the concept of getting some insider information to that world beforehand. And 
it was like I think they focused on like three characters. One of them was the the crazy pilot, and in that story, yes, he did get kidnapped by aliens. That actually was a true event. He just wasn't some weird guy talking that kind of thing. So I found that to be interesting into interesting into itself, mainly because up to that point movie adaptations were usually like a poor version of the same movie yeah yeah retelling that story and it's like there's nothing really here for me the, and they didn't have they didn't usually have the top artists of the day on them no mm-hmm. and sometimes the characters didn't even look like the actors because they didn't really have the license for it either for the likeness of this i i have the um artist edition of the Walter Simonson Aliens one. That one's pretty good. Yeah. Or Alien one, pardon me. The original movie. They did, uh, I forget who published that. I didn't even know it existed. Um, there was, was it Heavy Metal who did it? A heavy Metal or, pre, or, I think it was, it came out in, in, heavy, in heavy Metal, yeah. yeah. So it was before Dark Horse had the license. Yeah, long before. Oh, it was when the yeah. first movie came out. Yeah. But there's an artist... That was pretty well done. Uh, you know, it was a. It at least had good art because it was Al Williamson, Blade Runner. There we go, the Blade Runner one, which no one knows why it's comic book sized. Mm-hmm. Because that was um, what was the name of the magazine series it ran in? Marvel Super Special. Marvel Super Special, which were movie adaptations done at magazine size. Except for Blade Runner, which was done at comic book size. Weirdly. I even asked Jim Salakrup, the editor on it, did not remember why it was done at comic book. Everyone, do everyone like... just speculated that they maybe they thought it would sell more at that size. Ah, but they well, it doesn't really matter because at the time all of the super specials were re-edited to, uh, to come out in a, in a mini-series, that, which was comic size. They did, but that was on newsprint. Mm-hmm. The Blade Runner one was on the glossy magazine paper. And then they usually, like I said, put it a newsprint reprint of it um, at like in a mini-series. This one was mm-hmm. just in that one shrunken magazine. <laughs> it was strange. Let's see. I unlearned most of my French class when I returned to U.S. high school. (laughs) Foreign language dreams are when you got fluency. (laughs) Kirby's 2001 Treasury is the only good one I can remember. That one's pretty... That's his own riff, though, isn't it? It's not really an adapt... I haven't read it. I haven't looked at it in so long. I don't know if I ever actually read it. I only have a digital version of it. I think it is a riff because... uh, Well... uh... Kirby was familiar with the with the novel, so oh, okay. yeah. So we would Walter go if, if needed, he would go straight to the novel for concepts. Walter Simonson's T two adaptation is killer. I don't know that. I know he did. Didn't he do RoboCop? RoboCop versus Terminator with yeah, Frank Miller. With, with, with Miller. Yeah, the the art on the RoboCop adaptation by by Mark Teixeira is uh, is interesting, okay. but the. It suffers from the same problem as all the other adaptations, which, which is the flow. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the main problem when you adapt yeah. a, a movie. And Dead Quinn says, comics into movies created major problems. Now that comics became, yeah, the movie scripts. The, the old idea where you're reading a comic thinking, ah, they're writing this as a movie pitch. They don't feel this. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Speaking of Baker, his Howard the Duck adaptation was as good as hell. I he did the Howard the Duck movie adapt. I didn't even know. I don't remember that at all. I wonder if I have it. Was that in <laughs> Marvel movie? Sp- Marvel, which? Yeah, I think it. Marvel if if it wasn't the if it wasn't the last one, it was one of the last three. I might have it. I'm gonna have to. I haven't looked at my Marvel super specials in a long time. Yes, yeah, so that, that be Blade Runner one. 1985 or 86, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like Mike Mignola's Dracula adaptation. That one looks real nice. Mignola adapted the movie or adapted, or adapted the novel? The movie. Okay. The Matrix short story. That one is, I actually have, um, Spencer Lamb edited those a few years ago, gave me a collection of the hardcover ones. There's the 
the Matrix um, short story. It's not an adaptation of the Matrix. It's more short comic stories that take place in the Matrix world. And they're really good. They're well done. A lot of good artists, good writers. I, I have a video somewhere in my channel showing it off. Before I read it, I showed it off. That That's actually a good book. I forget the name of it, but uh, that made Sterenko's Outland and Heavy. I still have yet to see, because that's not been collected anywhere, right? Sterenko's Outland? Mm, never heard of it. I collection. don't think so. I, I, I've always wanted to read that, but never have gotten it, because I've never been a heavy metal collector. So, mm -hmm. Adaptation of Albert Pyong's Cyborg was really, I don't know that one at all. Dark Horse did a lot of movies. Yeah, they did a lot of... Uh, and Dark Horse had a lot of licensed stuff, too, but I never... The Treasury is an adaptation of the movie that he riffed on it in the monthly regular-sized comic. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not yeah, talking the, about Robocop well, versus Tokyo. I'm talking about yeah, Klaus but, Jansen T2. Sorry. Okay, I don't know yeah, that the, one the, at all. The Treasury adapts the movie, but if needed, Kirby would, get, would lift concepts straight from the novel. All right. Because they probably look better if you just do Outland. them as he understood the the novel. Outland was never collected. Pion. Yeah, a lot of it. I, I always heard um, this rang true to me. I'm a big fan of the um, Firefly TV show. I was one of the few people that watched it when it ran, when they ran them out of order on Fox. <laughs> and then it became a, a cult hit show a few years later. Always a fan of it. And they, I think it may have been Dark Horse, maybe 10 years later, started doing some Firefly comic books. And I bought a couple of them. They were okay. And it was during that time I read a criticism of them that rings true to me. And it was a criticism of licensed comics in general. When it said, um, when you buy a licensed comic, what you really want is more of the original thing you liked. I.e., if it's a movie or a TV show, you really want more of the TV show or more of the movie. And what you almost always get is a second-rate comic book. <laughs> so they're almost always disappointing. I was like, you know what? That rings true to me. Because those Serenity comics, though I read maybe the first series or two of them, they were I was just disappointed every time. Because I, I didn't really want mediocre Serenity comics, Firefly comics. I wanted more Firefly TV shows. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I think of that every time I see, because there are very few license, very few licensed comics that are good comics. Mm. They're mostly done yeah. for the license. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're done for the license. And I vote, I did. There's very few that I would probably say that I enjoyed the comic book more than what whatever it sprung from. Like I probably enjoyed the GI Joe comics more. Then uh -huh. the G.I. Joe TV show. Right. Car or cartoon <laughs> show. But then you had something like you had the licensed star comics. And I was like, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I wanted to read Thundercats as a comic by Marvel. Right. And you're giving me an adaptation of the TV show for kids. Ah. You weren't giving me a superhero story done by um by Mar my Marvel in, in that kind of aspect, and many many licenses were were that way, just about across the board. You know, only a few things got good, and that's not many of them. Yeah, let's see what we got here. Yeah, now that heavy metal is defunct, you'll never get collections. Yeah, Outland's never going to be collected. Firefly stood well, on bidness. <laughs> Medi mediocre Serenity comics were a blessing. For a moment, they were. <laughs> Media tie-ins are, are afterthoughts quickly pumped out. Usually, not always, but almost. Like, Dark Horse, I know, put out a lot of comics that people like. 
Uh, like they like the alien stuff. They like the Terminator. I think Dark Horse was trying to put out good comics. Not that I ever bought many of them. I occasionally read them in DHP, but I think like stuff like that they were trying. But certainly not in my day in the '80s when I was buying adaptations from Marvel or DC. <laughs> I was reading Oni Agretsuko. Agresu uh, I don't know that one at all. I only saw it once, The Crow City of Angels by Tim Bradstreet from Kitchen Sink Press, but it's pretty good. Imagine, it must look good at least. It did feel like, yeah, I don't know that show at all. Larry Hama, G.I. Joe was better than the Sun Bow Garbage. Yeah, I, I never read much of the G.I. Joe series because I was too old for it. But I, I hear people like, uh, who is it? Um, his name just flew up, flew out of my head. Who shows up here every now and then? He he d puts out these videos on characters and where the, and sometimes they're GI Joe stuff and he and he goes through the history and explanation of the GI Joe characters and Larry Hama put a lot of story into those GI Joe characters. I mean, a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. On, so it's like more than average, I would say. That's why people like that comic so much. People are loving current Transformers and G.I. Joe comics done by pro fans. of Yeah, the um, the Skybound stuff. I know Wilson likes it. And I've seen people in my comic shop are loving it, too. The what's the guy's name? Warren. He did a cover here. Daniel Warren Johnson. Transformers. People are really liking that. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Dark Horse manga adaptations of the OG Star Wars trilogy are so good. I know, like I said, I've seen online, who is it? Stupid Chainsaw Productions is a guy who I've been watching on YouTube for a decade now. He's come and gone a few times. But he's a real big Star Wars guy. And he's read, like, everything Star Wars. All the books, all the comics, all, and sometimes he goes over them and reviews them. And it's just amazing to me that there's people who care so much about the star wars um expanded universe and have read all the stuff i find it you know i i find you know his enthusiasm or interest in it interesting so it's like hmm there are people to who who take there are people who take those marvel star wars comics seriously <laughs> get i'm not people <laughs> Did Hama work uh, work come before the cartoon? Um, I think he worked on the toy line. Like they had him designing a lot of the toy line. They were really, oh. the cartoon and the toys were released about the same time. The but cartoon I, you know, was made. The cartoon was made to sell the toys, right? And the comic book was just that third trifecta of it. But so Larry was creating the lore of it in the right. comic books to be used in the uh, toys to be used in the cartoon. You were not allowed to advertise the toys in the cartoon. That was right. one of those FCC rules. So you couldn't advertise G.I. Joe's toys in a G.I. Joe cartoon, like the cartoon wasn't advertised. So therefore, they had, them, they had Marvel do the comic, and they advertised the comic. That was their way of getting around the you can't advertise the toys. Right. So they eat the animated artwork for the Marvel comic because they had the cartoon commercial, you know, read the rest of the story in Marvel Comics. And then that animated studio eventually went on to continue the cartoon series to start. The right. and, and, and originally, they I think they hired Larry Hama to do a lot of the backstory on the toys. Right, as well as the comic, he and was I think doing it was the cards on the back. Right, right. He did, and it was I think Bob Budiansky who did the same thing with Transformers. Was it Bob was giving the Transformers? He started right. it. He named like Megatron and Optimus Prime. He said he couldn't work on it, and then so he gave it back to Jim Shooter, and then I think Jim took it from there. Right. So, so they were like the toy company was hiring the Marvel writers to come up with this stuff, right? And then Marvel had the connection with Sunbow to make those commercials, right? 
Mm -hmm. The current Transformers is, but yeah, everybody likes that current Transformers. Hannah is my hero. What did he say? He went from has been who nobody would hire to industry legend in, in the last 10 years. People are doing YouTube videos and are loving it, Richard. Yeah, they are. Jackson will be leaving art duties after issue six. So only only get that first TPB. Now, yeah. so still writing the book. Okay. Hammer populated lifeless objects with characters and meaning and guns. There's a good description of it from yeah. Dick Drainer. <laughs> uh, Undead Queen. Him working on art was too much for him when it comes to the IP ownership overloaded with a heavy, uh, heavy workload. I guess that's uh, Daniel Warren Johnston. Yeah. The manga adaptations were fine, but the best part must be the Adam Warren's cover illustrations. Oh, okay. Him worry it was too much. Uh, IP owners over, you know, uh, the Transformers doing, sometimes doing those licensed books is more work than it's worth because of all the corrections they have you do. Yeah, Hammer's responsible for the G.I. Joe's extensive lore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, the, the other first issue <coughs> I got this week was um where is it uh here we go was the daniel warren jo <coughs> i actually didn't like either of these covers very much and this is a daniel warren johnson cover which is a fine drawing but i just don't find it very striking as a cover napalm lullaby by rick remender and one named bengal or bengal i don't know which one um Some nice art. It was I, I. I picked it up. I generally like Rick Remender's writing. Little nudity for you, but I picked this up and and the artwork kind of caught my eye, so I figured I'd give it the first issue a read. And I can only describe it as typical Rick Remender first issue. I don't know what this series is going to be about. He, he, except for his explanation in the back, which I didn't under—I understood it better once he gave this explanation. Um, to, 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 where is it? Somewhere in here, it tells us we're saying it's—it's it's about. It's about two people who have no hope of changing the world in a system that isn't going to change, trying to change the world kind of thing. And in the beginning of our story, we get these people at a protest. We don't know what they're protesting. They're just protesting. Then at the end, then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're just driving along in their pickup truck. And this giant robot thing comes out of a portal and they're like and these mech guys come out of the portal too um and then they're like what is it uh the last of the mech wounds almost makes me feel sorry for it so then they open it up and the, the robot they were chasing is this mech wound with a baby in it so they're obviously doing a Superman riff to begin the story. And um, then, of course, the two guys stand around arguing over who's going to kill the baby this time. So the baby kills them. <laughs> it's like it's a good something twist. that only happens in fiction. You know, it's like, you know what, if these guys had just done their job and killed the baby. So then these... Um, this, you know, the... the, the, the the man and woman go, oh, a baby, like Ma and Pa Kent. Then at the end, we get them saying, oh, you know, they're, you kind of get the feeling they're saying God answered our prayers. Um, now we have a baby. But then at the end, they say, praise be to Glowcore. So they got some weird God in a cult. So, so these two cult members just found Superman. Then it flashes forward 50 years later. And the entire world is under the heel of this cult. The cult worldview is now the only worldview that's allowed. We assume 
baby Superman grew up and made this happen. But we don't see Superman the whole rest of the book. The whole rest of the book are these two characters trying to pull off a heist. And... Well, actually... In, in, in the grand Rick Remender tradition, he introduced, like in the first issue, he introduces you to a whole bunch of characters who then never appear again. So it starts off with this character delivering some package and going to a, pros a, a virtual prostitute. Then it turns out, now we get into our heist, the virtual prostitute and her brother, it turns out, it's, ne it's never mentioned their brother and sister until the back when Rick Remender mentions it. So they're, they're trying to get away with a heist. Meanwhile, these guys are chasing after them and eventually they get away with whatever they're saying. And, and though the brother and sister are the two that are fighting the system impossibly. And it was just kind of like, all right, I don't really know what this book is about, which happens a lot. Rick Remender has a way of, because I read Fear Agent, which like every 12 issues of the 36 issues or whatever it is of Fear Agent, every 6 to 12 issues, the whole concept of Fear Agent would change. It would just be like, it's a whole new comic book now. The whole concept has changed. And it was kind of the same thing with that one I just bought the big volume of, Black Science. Once again, in the 50 issues of Black Science, the whole basic concept changed like half a dozen times at least. So I fully expect that to be the same with this. So I can't tell you what's going to happen in it. <laughs> Have you guys read much Rick Remender stuff? I don't recall if I have. Mostly yeah. Marvel stuff. I don't have any of his indie work. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sure it's quite different. It says, I like Warren as much as the next guy, but I'll take his Sao Tom, uh, Tamaki over him any day. He's That's the um, Star Wars one. The Remender Oppression story. Yeah, I guess that's a way to describe it. Those interiors are terrifyingly good. Yeah, that's, that's what made me pick him up. Rick Remender is another one who, like Tom King, is really good at picking good artists. I Yeah, I skipped. I only had four comics on my poll list this week so i picked up two off the shelf so that's as babies tend to do you know murder the mechs that are chasing them the jesus cult like story yeah there's but it's like the cult the whole superman and cult angle was gone after the first six pay it was just like 50 years later okay We've established how this cult took over the entire world. Superman helped them. Now I don't think they matter, so I don't know what's going on. Ah, speaking of threatening babies, another Baker gem comes to mind. Ah, Superman's babysitter in that Bizarro Comics collection. Uh, Bunch of indie creators doing... Su uh, that was the one that got uh, pulled from the shelves. The original comic before the collection had Super Baby killing people or something. And I think it was only it, copies got to England, but they were pulled from the shelves here in the U.S. and they canceled it. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, <laughs> Remender seems boy. I like you know he's okay. Like that he picks really good artists. The guy who did uh, Black Science was good. He had a, the guys who did um, Fear Agent were good. I liked his The Sacrificers. I don't think I read that one. Yeah. It's how Tamaki interiors on that Star Wars stuff. Only a righteous thirst. For, oh, that one was real. I, that's the last thing I read by him. Andre Lima uh, Arujo. I don't know if I got Good it. Enough. Good I enough. was close. Closer than I was when I was coming out. Remender is probably best in trade. That that I really did like Fear Agent reading it month to month, though. His Animal Man was interesting, too. I, I, I did, and I liked his... Um, what was it? Uh, that one, uh, Righteous Thirst for Vengeance monthly, too. Those were both good monthly. But like I said, I read Black Science all in trade. It, you know, it was good that way, too. Don't think Super Baby was killing anyone. It was an issue of child endangerment. Oh, it was a child endangerment. Okay, I don't remember. I remember the controversy. I don't remember the what exactly it was about. 
it's, it's I one do of those have the bizarro hardcover somewhere. It's one of those things where they think their their readers are idiots. <laughs> well, someone, someone dis- after the uh, bat penis made its appearance. What is that? A decade ago now. About five that- years. Uh, yeah, I thought that was that wasn't too long. I uh, time long slips away so quickly. I'm not sure. Yeah. But once again, I read someone else mentioned this, and it, I think I mentioned it before in this, and it ran, rings true with me. Um, the the problem comes when the same characters you market to children, you also make adult stories with adults for, you know, stories for adults with. So when all of a sudden, you know, you're you're marketing Super Baby to children and then Kyle Baker does this joke adult version of Super Baby, everybody gets up in arms about it. Like, oh, I can't believe Batman showed his penis. Well, it was a... Okay, about Super Baby, nobody actually got up in arms. The only people who got up in arms were were the suits at, at Warner. Yes. When the... yes, because nobody actually saw it when it came out. Yeah, and when they heard about it, oh, what's the, what's the problem? Because the first thing that happened back then, and it, and uh, and pirating comics was still not a thing, because uh, yeah. most people still had dial-up connections. Um, but the the art to to the Super Baby story appeared online, all of it, uh, and we and everybody read it. And what's the problem here? And it's a the, joke. <laughs> Despite beautiful art in Rick Remender's the Rick Remender written Seven to Eternity, I did not like that one very much. I don't remember now why now, but I, that one did not grab me. Not to be fair, aren't they? <laughs> so I think the babysitter let him get inside a microwave. Ah, that could have been it. Tokyo they did, Ghost. They, they did the the story ends with Super Baby being inside a microwave while it was on. But we know it's Superman. Yeah. Nobody's going to put babies inside the microwave because they saw it in a comic. <laughs> Let's try this at home. Tokyo Ghost, that Rick Remender, and um, ooh, all of a sudden I can't remember the, the guy who went on to do his own Batman universe. Oh, what's his uh, name? Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, Sh- uh, Sean, uh, Sean, Sean, yeah, it's Sean, not McIver. Ah, we'll remember in a second. I'm, I'm more for a sci fi, Sean, Mur- Sean, Sean Murphy, Sean, Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy. There we go. Man, I wish I could have gotten a with back cock before they pulled the issue. I saw it online. Jokes are problematic. Man, did you miss the greatest penis ever? It was a life changing experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The bat penis. Let's see what else did I get. Oh, here's yeah, the we've, one. We've seen the we've seen Doctor Manhattan's radioactive pe- penis. Uh, nothing yeah. comes close after that. Dark Ride by um, what's his name? Joshua Williamson and uh, Andre Brasson. and they got two guys who did Birthright. And I think this is coming to an end soon. Well, I've assumed it. Uh, because he mentioned writing the ending is really hard for this. So I'm like, oh, I guess um coming to an end. But this one's been fun. It's been about this um horror theme park that the guy made a deal with the devils, with demons to get running. And now it's 30 years later, and he uh, and the demons are come back for their payment, and the payment is his now adult children. So uh Lots of fun horror stuff going on in this one. There he is. He's on the strings. But what's also funny about this is I was talking to my uh, comic shop owner. And I I don't know how many copies of this he sells in the shop. Six. But now he's got an extra 50 copies of it. Because two guys bought the 1 in 25 cover, pre-ordered the 1 in 25 covers, which had something to do with the Disney homage. I don't even know what they look like. But now he's got an extra 50 copies of it that he can't sell. And he's like, 
he was saying he's he's not sure if he's even going to do pre-orders like that anymore because it's becoming too much of a burden to even store the extra copies that he can't sell. Because when when somebody orders a 1 in 25 of this, he has to sell them at a price because he has to buy 25 copies of it. So he has to sell them at a price that covers those 25 copies. But he can't sell them. So I was like, what does he do? He has at times, different times, sold them to those mystery box guys for pennies on the dollar. But he's like, I don't even know if I want to do it. He's like, it's too, it is too much storing all these comics, multiple copies of all these comics he can't sell. But it's a good comic. Right. <laughs> I enjoy it. But 50 extra copies of it? What are you going to do? Do a giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Bat wing, cut or uncut? You know what? I don't remember. I think it was cut. I didn't pick I'm up the not, book. It may have been in it. shadow. That I don't remember. I Damn, an Elf World comic is still worth 180. I'm seeing it online now. That the black label one, you mean? The uh, bat, no, bat, the, bat wang one was black. No, label, the, 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 Elf, the 80 page giant with oh, the super baby. Oh, the super baby one. Okay, yeah. that was an Elf World one. Black label overcorrected due to that. Yeah. The shop owner I got a that shop owner got to eat the cost. It's it's not the he doesn't have to. I mean, why would he eat the cost? Why would he sell a comic book that costs him how much is a four dollar comic probably cost him two dollars? So that one in twenty five is gonna cost him fifty two dollars. Why is he going to sell that for $4? That's a way to go out of business fast. <laughs> nice. Make a deal with the devil for someone else's soul. Yeah, I, I didn't know that you could do that. I, I, I don't know what kind of lore they're using. I thought you could only sell your own soul. Some comic shops make people order them, pay for the 25 com- Yeah, that's what mine does. If you want the one in 25, you're paying, you know, $55 for it to cover the 25. Because they, if they're not ordering 20, it's one thing if they're ordering 25 comics. But if they're not, they can't seem to cut, but very shadowy. Yeah, I don't remember. That moil. <laughs> you can't accept comic shops to eat the price of these ratio comics. That's mm-hmm. just nuts. I know, there, a matter of fact, that one comic shop uh, that went out of business used to do that. Who was that? That was the Staten Island one that um, Big E from the um, New York Warriors used to go to. What they used to do, I guess if there were um, comics they were getting a lot of copies of, they'd put the like ratio variants into a random customer's poll list and allow them to buy it for, you know, cover price if they wanted it. They went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was the cause of them going out of business, but it probably didn't help. Yeah. yeah. I would think a shop would charge $100 if it cost them 50. Yeah, they might. I don't know what the exact cost is, but they have to cover the <coughs> And like he he would sell them online too. Like he sells some of the ratio of he pre-sells them on eBay. And sometimes there'd be like, you know, one in a thousand. I I remember me telling the story of that Spider-Man number one from a few years ago where he sold two of the one in 2,500 covers on eBay, which meant he had to order 5,000 copies. Or no, they must have been one in a thousand. So he had to order 2,000 copies of Spider-Man 600 or whatever it was. And he sold 100 copies in the store, another 200 copies on eBay, and he had 1,700 copies of it that he couldn't sell, sitting in storage. But he covered the cost of everything with those two guys who bought the one in the thousands. So it was like the cost was covered, but now he can't get rid of those comics. Dark Ride number one got a jaw-dropping ending. The kid didn't deserve that final. Yeah, 
At the beginning, I really thought he was the main character of the series. Yeah. The the first issue was about this kid who got his first job. He he's a huge horror fan, huge huge fan of the um the theme park. Got a job at the theme park and got killed by the demons at the theme park. That's how like the first issue ended. His sisters become a character who's coming in to try and I use variants for insulation. It's a yeah. huge waste of paper. It is. Dark Ride number one was bait and switch, not in the wrong way. <laughs> yep, I've been enjoying. Like I said, I liked Birthright from beginning. I think they did a really good job with Birthright. And Birthright, I think they really stuck the landing on. And it also had one of the best sort of um, post, post climax arcs to they did you know the whole story climaxed and then they had a final arc that was all just epilogue and they did a real good job with that epilogue so they're an automatic buy for me now if williamson and brisson are doing something they're an automatic i don't even have to test it out they're going on my pull list i got faith in them now <laughs> <laughs> The ratio of predatory practice. They're, they're just ways to bump up the numbers for the... But if there are people who want to buy them, that's the crazy thing. There are, but it, there, there are a lot of people complain about these things. Yeah. Both readers and retailers. Just stop buying them. But if somebody wants to buy it, why not take their money? That's what it comes to. Okay, yeah, in that case, yeah, but okay, uh, has for the two hundred for a hundred or two hundred dollars up front. Yeah, that well, that's what he it, does. He pre-sells them on eBay. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. But it, still, it, figuring out what to do with the seventeen hundred comic books, just throw them away. Uh, yeah, he's he, they're that, paid for, but nobody wants to pick them up. Yeah. That kill it's it's not the ratio variants that kill comic shops. What kills comic shops are the incentive variants, which are the ones like DC did it a lot. I don't know if they still are. I haven't heard complaints about it. like ratio variants, at least are simple. Marvel always did ratio variants. If you buy 25 copies. Of Amazing Spider-Man, you now have a chance to buy this one in 25. Straightforward, you know it. But um, the incentive variants are different. They are, um, let's say you, let's say the new issue of Batman comes out with an incentive variant. The incentive variant is, if you want this Batman variant, you have to order... 150% of this random other comic. This Batman. So it's like, if you want this Batman number one incentive variant, you have to this month order 150% of your Robin issues from last month. Um, if you want this incentive variant for Superman you have to order 125% of what you ordered last month on Supergirl and 125% of what you ordered last month on Justice League. So the comic shop owner has to keep track of all that. They have to go look up what they bought, do the math, and put that new number in in order to get this comic they want. And it's really confusing. Because they usually don't want those other comics. And like and it gets really and it's like the the incentives are all over the place. You have to order 125% of this, 150% of that, da 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 da. And it's hard for the comic shop owners to keep track of. And my comic shop owner is a programmer. He actually is a code guy who runs the comic shop on the side and writes code for a credit card company. He wrote the own code for his own for his ordering for what keeps track of everything in the comic shop. So he's no dummy. And he, and he does he hates the confusing nature of DC's incentive variants. So that's what really kills him. 
that person buys all the copies. Yeah. And sells them. You, the person he has always said to the guy, if you want the other 25 copies, they're yours. They always turn them down because they don't want to store 25 extra comics of a book they don't want. No, ratios are not incentive. They're two different things. Ratios are straightforward. Buy 25 copies, you can get this one. Incentive is you have to buy other variations of things to get this. In it, it incentivizes you to buy, to order other comics. <laughs> At last, I just saw this Kyle Baker's Super Baby story. My kid will love it. The art is delicious. <laughs> Nan sells them off, then uh, self, not the shop. Yeah, they're just sells them off, then self, not yet. He's he. I know he sold them off to. Have you ever seen those? Um, buy fifty mystery comics for thirty five dollars. Mile High Comics just did it because they have so many comics. He sold them off to some of those guys in the past. Guys who sell mystery boxes for, you know, he sells them a long box full of comics. For twenty dollars, it's all you know, pennies on the dollar. But you know he can't sell them, so give them to the mystery box guy. Mm -hmm. He's willing to ship them and give him twenty bucks. <laughs> Here's another of the books that I. Oh, let's see what do you got. I got in Rover Market. So this is the Forever War. It's an it's a comic book adaptation of a science fiction novel. Uh, by American author uh, Joe Alderman. I I've heard who, of that, but never read The Forever War. Yeah, so the guy won a nebula. Not, I'm not sure if he won a nebula with it or or, or not. But uh, he met this artist, is a Belgian artist, Marvano. Uh, and inside, you get you both have stuff that looks like heavy metal. Uh huh. And then. There's this, <laughs> which reminds you of the Dark Knight Returns. Exactly. <laughs> I thought it was a reprint of the Dark Knight Returns. <laughs> you tell the story through television. Mm -hmm. But you know the the rest is a uh, is more is more European. So so the 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 story doesn't flow that fast. Uh, there's a lot of talking. Uh, and not much, and not much action, which is even the explosions look look, uh, look European. <laughs> they don't <laughs> pack a punch. Um, this only this volume came uh, came out in, in Portugal. There are three volumes. Uh, they both got all three uh, got published in the in the space of a year, uh, which is that's not, not Frank usual. Miller. Just looks like him. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not Frank Miller. The, the artist is called Marvano, uh, but the, the, it was reprinted in two thousand and nine. Uh, all of the three volumes in one. Also, notice that this one is slightly bigger than the other one. So, oh, you see. you can't fit them in the same comic box. What good are they? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> huh. they seem to adapt a lot of American sci-fi novels and French comics. Says Sleepy Reader. It they seems adapt a lot of stuff. Bunch of you have Robert Silverberg adaptations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who copied is the question. Oh, the, uh, this one. Oh, this one. Uh, Marvano certainly had read the Dark Knight Returns by by that time, because yeah. it, it's practically copying the the way that the faces are drawn. The thing is, the the rest is typical typical heavy metal fare. Although this was not published in heavy metal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. I mean, let's go back to Solo to take a look at some. Okay, yeah, yes. So I guess if, some, if this was reprinted right now in, in English, I guess some people would be interested in something like this. I, I like European comics in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I like comics in general. I'd read from all over the world. See, one more thing I got this week, the last issue of Our Bones Dust. This wraps up the story. And it's weird that they introduced a character in the fourth and final issue. Yeah. But it was really because... You, you, you may have heard me describe this one as kind of... Um, 
kind of like Commandy, last boy on earth, except he wasn't the last boy. He was just a boy, a post-apocalyptic boy getting into trouble. And this one, sort of for the for the finale, for the finish, introduce him to a mother figure. So in the end, he kind of gets a mother. <laughs> but uh, good series. I liked the art in it. Um, it's by, written and drawn by Ben Stenbeck, who this is the first time he's made it onto my radar. But um, some nice artwork. This sort of post-apocalyptic desert artwork. It's uh, got some nice drawing in it. Oops, missed. But nice little series. Four issues. Probably be out in trade now. And um, some aliens in it, too, and post-apocalyptic Earth and humans fighting each other over scraps. That sort of thing. But very nice artwork, whoever Ben Stenbeck is, with with Dave Stewart on colors and Russ Wu-Tan on letters. Good stuff. Let's see. What do we... Ba, 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 ba. When you were at the small book fair at the Oriente subway train station, I bought some there too. Wolves yeah. at the Walls by Gaiman, University 2 by Frank Cho, and an yeah. educational history comic from the first Portuguese artist working in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Zeus. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There were a few of those. That, that, those were pretty, the, the comics were distributed, were laid out a little bit haphazard, haphazard but uh, you, so there was much variety. Like there were, 20 of these these were warehouse uh -huh. finds yeah because back back then in the in the late 80s you had to print like 5,000 of these when you were only expected to sell 200 so <laughs> so that's why the, this publisher went out of business right because <laughs> a lot of them were in the in, in warehouses and sometimes they, they they discover a few lost uh, lost copies batman dylan dog is very much a french european comic with batman <laughs> italian uh, oh. Dylan Duck's published by a company called Bonelli. They they have control of the characters that, that they publish. Um, and Dylan Duck is right now probably their their uh, best selling comic. It sells about eighty thousand copies every month in, in Italy. Sleepy Reader says it felt a lot of the story was stuffed in the final issue of Our Bones Dust after slow going in the early issues. That's because I think they introduced a lot of the sort of high, uh, con high concepts of it in the last issue. The first three issues were really about that little boy trying to, that teenage kid surviving and the gang of people coming after him. And, and we really didn't know what was going on. And they introduced a lot of the sort of background stuff in the last issue. <laughs> but it was a nice wrap up. They gave you answers to a lot of stuff that you were wondering about. <laughs> I have, this, I have a Spider-Man comic from Portugal. It's cool. Homo yeah. Aranha. Homo Aranha. Homo Aranha. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was happy with the wrap-up of Our Bones Dust. Um, I thought it was okay. Especially after they nearly beat the kid to death. With the, that, that was the one I was complaining about. The, uh, the guy who had a knife in his chest and wouldn't die. But an arrow in his chest and a knife in his chest, and he was still beating up this kid. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not how the human body works. You don't win the fight with a knife through your heart. You fall down and die. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm hmm. I haven't bought yet. I haven't bought Spider Man in quite a while. But then again, not much to be interested about. <laughs> I have to figure out what old thing I'm going to pull off my shelf and read now that I finished Why I Hate Saturn. No, I still have plenty of new things to read. <laughs> I do like I still have to read that new Grendel Devil by the Deed Master Edition. It'll be interesting. All those to own. Simpsons comics. What was that? 
that would be interesting to own. I don't yeah. actually have a copy of Devil by the Deep, but so so I, I'd like to to own one. Yeah, I own I like a few copies of Devil by the Deep. <laughs> Those a favorite. I have the original. Well, first of all, I have it in Mage. Mm -hmm. I have the original uh, graphic novel edition of it. I have a reprint graphic novel edition of it with new colors. And I have that master edition that's got even more new colors. I, I kind of like the original colors best, but, you know. <laughs> I haven't read it in a while, so I'm looking forward to reading the master edition to see what he did with it. And the other book, the, the other comic that I picked up, the Portuguese get? edition of Mr. Punch by Neil Mr. Gaiman Punch. and Dave McKean. Yeah, and it's an art cover and everything. Uh -huh. Is that a Punch and Judy thing? Uh, yeah. This came out through Vertigo, what, 20 years ago? Wow. So, it, I just it's don't understand. Dan, while Vertigo's not around anymore. Uh, mismanagement. Yep. Ain't that always the story? <laughs> the suits are in charge, and they know nothing of what of the product that they're trying to sell. Especially since Marie Javens always thought she'd end up running Vertigo. And not DC Comics in general. Because she was always the indie editor at Marvel. She was editing for Epic and a lot of indie stuff after Epic. Not typical Dave McKean, right? No. So they had the perfect person to run Vertigo there. And got rid of Vertigo. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, with the with all of the, um, the changes in ownership in the last few years. Yeah, they and, don't know. And and then running after trying to run uh, run after Marvel because hey, don't we have comic books? Somebody noted, oh, we have comic. Let's make movies. Live the comic books. <laughs> what about the fabled Burger Books imprint? Turned out no yeah. one cared. Yeah, but Less then again, no, nobody advertises anything anymore. Yeah. And the the idiots who run the the comic book websites aren't actually interested in comic books. They only want to talk about movies, you know, or make those stupid top ten lists. Uh, Where would you advertise to make. anything anymore? It's like uh, Bad Idea got their best advertising through stunts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't even know if if I were running Burger Books, where would I advertise? <sighs> I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the. I mean, a, a lot of comic, but a lot of comic people have been. There, no, that's not true. There are more uh, one uh, comic book fans and wannabe artists. Yeah, doing stuff on Instagram than the comic book companies. That may be true. Last Spider-Man book I picked up with the Tim Sale Jeff Loeb joint. Which one was that? Was that one of those year ones or what do they call them? Spider-Man Marvel. Spider-Man Blue. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah, remember that. The, one. the ones with the colors. All the eh, the Portuguese editions of Spider-Man of a nice quality. The worst phase of Spidey's and glossy paper. <laughs> yeah. Burger Boo. Yeah. Ah, that that's why there was no Mr. Punch left when I went there. Paolo got it. <laughs> no, there are still there were still four or five. Uh, okay, so let's see Dark Horse's Instagram. Last thing there, February twelfth. Before that, February seventh. Before that, isn't that wait, essentially that a Vertigo board? with corporate glow up? Uh, I think that was a Vertigo one that he was showing. That was originally oh. published by Vertigo. Is that the one you, Mister Punch? Yeah. Yeah. They picked the wrong crowd. TikTok. Oh wait. <laughs> okay. No. Turns out these are just the. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 these are stuck at the top. No. The they they do put stuff, but it's so anonymous. Dark Horse. So Dark Horse Comics put a four. Four. 
four posts in the last 24 hours. So if this is normal, why can't nobody notice this? I don't get it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess you'd have to go to social media and try to get some attention. I don't know how yeah, you do but, that. Yeah, but nowadays you can't you can't you can't get any attention uh, on Facebook because they anything that you try to do to pull people out out of Facebook, so if, if it has a link, it, it now gets hidden in the algorithm. I, I and, see a lot of Kickstarter comic book stuff uh, as ads on Facebook, I have to say. Oh, as That's ads, the one but, thing I do see. Well, yeah, it adds because they're buying those ads. But the problem is, is yeah. that, you know, you buy an ad, it doesn't really reach any more or less people. And then all they do is start hitting you with more, buy, an ad, buy another ad, buy more ah. ads, buy more likes. So they're so Facebook, Instagram all those companies that are trying to sell you to buy ads, then all you do is get ads all day. Please buy more ads. Uh, and, you know, you have X amount of followers who are following you for a reason, but are not seeing the ads that you're paying for because they're uh, pushing it out to other sets of people. And all they want to do is get you to, again, buy more ads. Once they monetize, right stuff like facebook and stuff like that you don't get you don't get your stuff seen by the correct people who wants to follow you as it is and then you know and people people are not dumb they know when someone's trying to sell them something so if you're following dark horse you already are aware of what dark horse puts out you right, want to right. see more of the dark horse stuff i think that's where the problem comes with it too it's like you know, and do you buy an ad somewhere on social media and then these comic book companies, especially something like Dark Horse, do they have a social media person that could try to sell you a comic book without it sounding like an ad? Yeah. People don't want ads. That's the thing, too. They go on social right. media to get away from ads. <laughs> a lot of people selling stuff on Tic Tac now. Karen Berger imprint still exists. I thought Bendis imprint of Dark Horse had replaced it. Yeah, I don't know. Berger books is under Dark Horse a lot. A lot of those did not catch my attention. Yeah, I don't. Why no, does the, the, only the things that reprint that were reprints of uh, former Vertigo properties were, were actually yeah. interesting. <laughs> Why doesn't anyone see it? Because nobody reads comics anymore, save for the people in the stream. Yeah, that's a problem too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe you maybe but if you want to get that one in two fifty variant and pay hundred dollars for it, right? I would advertise with specific YouTubers like Comics Trope and Pop Culture Philosophers. That'd probably be a good idea. Comics Trope. A tropes. lot of those burger I'm book sure writers. Comics people, I'm not sure Comics Tropes is interested in um in in having advertising. But if they threw him some it, money. He might be sure, but that that would require uh, money. Re, no, that, that that would require it, it, on someone like comic comic tropes. You, you, they need to change the format of the uh, of their videos. Yeah, because it's because they, they they need to start putting their faces uh, on camera so they can show the books. Let's see another comic I got this week was the final issue of the first story arc of Petrol Head. Uh -huh. A comic where the, everybody's made out of candy. Yeah, and the one where robots drive cars instead of transforming into them. Yes. There, there is something weird going on with this issue. I don't know what's up with their printing or coloring, but I think some of their... Something like... That looks like a normal page. It's a little light. Then the next page is super dark. And the first four issues didn't have any of these troubles. Now that looks like a normal page right there. And then another normal page. Let's see, where's the... And then another, a super dark one. And there's no... I, I didn't think there was any storytelling reason for these suddenly to be super dark. There's another normal one. But there was about... Um, Two or three spreads 
that were all of a sudden super dark, noticeably darker than the rest of the book. And it was like, what's going on here? Other, you know, other than that technical issue, it was another good issue. Except, is it really an end of the story arc when there's a, like a to be continued? <laughs> because the in this whole first story arc, there's a story about this ex-robot race car driver. They don't even let robots drive race cars anymore. That form of entertainment has ended. And this scientist with a young daughter, and there's like pollution outside the cities or something, and this scientist invented something to clean up the pollution. But for some reason, the I think it's a robot that runs the city thinks it's dangerous and doesn't want him to do it. And there's different levels of the city. Like the center of the city where all the humans live and the rich people has got good air. The next level has got bad air. The next level is bad air. The next level outside, really bad air. So they this whole, fir, this whole first story arc, they, they were trying to get outside like the main city. So at the very end, the welcome to the ozone, which I guess is the next level of whatever the city is. So it was like, that story doesn't end there. They, they got to keep on racing and chasing and running away from the people chasing them. But this is the end of the first story arc, they say. But I've been enjoying this one. It's been fun. And I like the artwork. Like I said, I, I like the everything's made out of candy look. Good stuff. Let's see what else we have here. Comic Tropes has slowed on making certain videos. Well, I think that's also because you run out of all the easy comic tropes to do. Can't wait for DC's most iconic IP to become public domain. Yeah. Hmm. You cannot afford running the multi-channels. I guess that's comic tropes. Okay. Now, Hell of Windhorn Dark Horse has an Elsa Charité alternative. No, I did not see that. I only, I, well, actually, I saw a couple covers of it, but I picked this one. There was one that was like the cover to the pulp novel that the guy wrote. And one other I didn't think was Elsa Charitier. So I don't know if I saw hers or not. It could have been a ratio variant. Who knows? Cool cover, Petrol Head. Yeah, like I said, I've liked the art on Petrol Head. And... Very colorful. The colorist is doing a great job just making everything colorful, which not everybody can do for some reason. Look at DC held up fables more than five or six. Wasn't DC in some sort of squabble with um, Bill Willingham? Yeah, Willingham decided that instead of dealing with DC, just make everything public domain. Ah, since it went public. Oh, that's right. That's right. No. He he was having squabbles with him, so he made everything public domain, at least on his end. Yeah, well, the people who are waiting for Superman to become public domain won't yeah. be able to actually do anything interesting with it because first you have to go, you only have the first two issues of Action Comics, and then you have to wait another year to get 12 more issues of Action Comics. Uh, so all of the interesting stuff does not show up until 1942 or so. So it's another four years. I will, uh, I will have him being a circus fly. strong man and leaping over tall buildings. But one yep. thing that you do know, Eric, as soon as Superman is in the public, Action Comics number one is in the public domain, Eric Larson will will make the, will have the character make an appearance and have sex with somebody. Yep, he will. <laughs> Why not? That's that's going to be that's probably going to be Savage Dragon for the ne uh, for the next couple of years as more characters go into the public domain. <laughs> They're all going to have sex. Of <laughs> a public domain orgy. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, Honestly, that's the... how you get around the fact that uh, you can't actually market some of these characters because the the trademark still owned by uh, by the corporation. But you just say something, the orgy, <laughs> and then you know the jacket I've been painting, the blazer. Oh yeah. yeah, let me get big for you. It's got a drawing board in the middle of it. Whoops! Nice. This is the back that I've been working on most of the week. 
Mm-hmm. Where are the flamingos? <laughs> no <laughs> flamingos. And there's the front. Nice. So well, the far, we got two oh. eyes up on the shoulders. You can have the flamingos uh, poking their their heads out of the of the breast pocket. <laughs> and art wasps. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, or the uh, where the pockets where you open up the pockets, the flamingos are hidden. <laughs> <laughs> I was also I, I might put a um, couple more paintings on the sleeves, like uh, tattoos, like pinup girls on the sleeves. Now that'll have to wait. Because that took all week to paint all that. Ooh. <laughs> Not to iron it now, too. And I put a little blue down on the trim. I still have to put uh, some more blue on that trim. But that's what I've been working on during my spring break. <laughs> Eric Larson is rule 34 of comic writers. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Thanks. No, I'm not looking forward to seeing what people will do with Superman. I'm looking forward to the imminent collapse of DC Comics and the industry as a whole. I'd like the industry to keep going. Maybe, you know, make some good comics for me to read. Not that I read any DC, but at least DC gave us Why I Hate Saturn many, many years ago under their Piranha Press imprint. And it's actually creator owned, I think, <laughs> rather than the DC fake creator owned stuff. Let's see, the last comic I got this week was the latest issue of No One. Issue 8. Wow, there's up to issue 8 already? This is the one by Kyle Higgins, who writes Radiant Black, and Brian Buccioletto, brother of Steve Buccioletto, who we worked with at Marvel, was a colorist, who we called Bucilato then. <laughs> Um, Geraldo Borges is the artist, I think. Geraldo Borges, colorist is Mark Englert, and letter is Hassan Atzmain Elhau. And this is the one that's kind of a police procedural, and it's hard to describe what's going on because imagine describing a police procedural. You know, eight eight episodes into a story. There's all sorts of stuff going on. There's the police. There's the podcasters. There's the journalist. There's the retired and now disgraced assistant police commissioner. There's his son who was arrested and jailed for the crime, but then had to be let go. There's a copycat criminal. There's, oh my goodness, there's so much going on in this one. But it's been fun. But uh, if you like superhero stories, that's not the one for you. <laughs> so, no eight. <laughs> uh, oh, that strip panel naked guy. Yeah. Oh, well, Love the last issue of Savage Dragon. Had a powerful sense at the end. We are creating a paper kids generation. <laughs> Well, that's the sentence you got of it. What about the me and the missus are trying to spice up the marriage? <laughs> the Said letterer. by a certain mouse. Oh, boy. What, the... what are you working on tonight, Wilson? I'm doing some corrections on a uh, comic book that I lettered for a buddy of mine. He's working on a on a corporate project. Ah. So this is a comic book that's, I guess, given away at a retreat or something. So it's a custom and comic? Custom comic. Uh, story wise, it's about an alien that is helping some humans out um, with uh, environmental stuff. Okay. And so I'm guessing whoever this company are, that, that that's part of their work. Yeah, about environmental cleanup and stuff like that. So I got called in. It's like, can you letter this project for me? So uh, that's what I was working on. 
and uh, I'm just doing corrections that he wanted to have tonight. He knows I have a show, but he was yeah. like, whenever you can jump on it, it's like, I'm going to be tired after the show. So let me just do the corrections <laughs> as I'm going along. <laughs> so this way here, once I'm done, I'm done. Right. <laughs> Often custom comics pay more than Marvel and DC. It's, it's, it has paid pretty good. Mm-hmm. And on time, so that's the ah. other thing too. There's no real wait. It basically yep. gets turned in, and then another couple of days later, ooh, money arrives. So I like they're, those projects. They're a real company, not a comic book company. <laughs> exactly, and they're happy with what they're getting. It's not yeah. a bunch of it's not nitpicking. Of they got a just budget. Like, yeah, they're thrilled they, to see the work. They're so happy to to see the work, and that's the best part because there's no there's no corrections. There's no to move this to the little to the left. Can you do this? You know this. No, there's none of that. It's like it's turned in and it's done. Uh, and uh. again, the, the more you get paid for a project, it seems like the less headaches you get. Yeah. Where I've worked <laughs> on projects where you know I got, I, you know, oh, could you please do this for me? I can't afford. Okay, fine. I do it, and then there's always something. How about this? Yep. Can you change that? Can you, oh, gosh. you're the sucker who helped him out. Exactly. So it's like no but more of that. For an actual budget, there's got plenty of people to. They're just happy that it's for a done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Let's see one last comment before we go. That one too, Paolo. I'm looking forward to more appearances of that crazy rat. Even Dragon's wife blushed over that sentence. (laughs) That was uh, Eric Larson's Mickey Mouse appearance in Savage Dragon. Mm -hmm. We should now keep keep tabs on every appearance of Mickey Mouse in in every media now that he's in the public domain. In Chris Jerusso's G-Man comic strip. He appeared in there. Mm. Huh. Uh, does anybody have any final thoughts for the evening? Not I really. Think, I don't think <laughs> I do. Really. I don't even think I wrote down any notes for this week. There wasn't anything I had to remember. I was too busy thinking about why I hate Saturn. So go out and buy yourself some what like I said, it, it was really strange my memory of reading this comparing to reading it now kind of thing was just like, it gave me an extra layer of interest in it. I like, like imagining 24 year old Jared reading it and what he thought as opposed like to 57. Of, I like the concept of going back and reading something you haven't read in so long yeah. that do you have a different mindset? Cause it's like, for me, every few years I go back and I try to read Frank, uh, Frank Miller's Ronin. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why each because t- it's like every 10 years I read it. And I don't know why I think I'm going to get a different story. Yeah. And I always enjoy the beginning of the book. And somewhere along the line, it's like I never finished the last story or last two stories. Nah. It's like I want it to be good. And yeah. visually, I enjoy it a lot. And I think that's why I keep going back to it because visual, especially something like this, as opposed to like a a superhero comic from your childhood, isn't quite the same, right? As something like even like when I read Asterius Polyp, um, when I first read, I think when I first read it when it came out, I was younger than the character. When the next time I read it, like ten years later. I was older than the character and I really had a, di- and the character was having a midlife crisis and I really had a different reaction to the character because of my different age. So uh, that was another one that was like that. Can't wait for stable diffusion generated public domain Superman comics where every character has sultry anime eyes and 27 fingers. That's going to be, <laughs> I was yep. actually, I'm actually going to make a video on AI art soon, but I haven't yes, quite all of it. all no of the Reed artists. Ripper slab this week. Next week we'll pick up with it again. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's the it's the Dolphins' day off. Right. And actually, uh, I just saw something. Kevin Kobasik posted something on uh, AI art in Stable Diffusion. I think it is now has a 
character consistency mode. So you can actually have the same character in different, it's now in a different panels. I and read it's going to wipe out storyboard artists. I read two headings this week about, uh, I didn't look into it, but apparently McFarlane had a contest recently to draw the covers. Uh -huh. And one of them that won was supposedly, allegedly an AI piece. And there's three images on DC Comics that are said to be AI drawn. Uh -huh. We'll go more into that next week. We'll, we'll, we'll make a note of that. It's right. The Spawn cover contest winner used AI. Whenever I reread Ronan, I can't unsee the endless life held swipes. Hey, <laughs> those homages. AI yeah, is getting a lot of reaction. It is. It's table diffuse on D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we'll sign off. Where are my balloons? Balloons? There's my, there's my confetti. Where's my balloons? Oh, there's the fireworks. Let's see. Balloons are one peace sign. There are my balloons. Hey, All right. You guys have a good week out there. We'll catch you next week with some AI talk and some uh, read ripping slabs. And we will find Sounds out who good. is the best. And we will find <laughs> out who is the best artist. I mean, prompt writer. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye.